welcome to the podcast, everyone. So this is something that we kind of set up last minute, but um, yeah, we thought it was a good time to like have another podcast. And today we have some really big names here. So we have Adolf, Microtransaction, Rex Senderex, and Subtractum, all really big ARPG content creators. And I want to just thank everyone for being here, first of all. And I would like to have like maybe a short one minute intro from everyone just, you know, to, uh, you know, show yourself to the audience uh, on all the streams. So let's start with DM and then Rex and Subtractum. Sure. Uh, I'm DM. I am somewhere they have a variety ARPG Andy. I bounce between them, as I suppose we all do. Uh, PoE is probably my home game at this point. And uh, that's about it. Try that fun. I'm Rex. I wear a blue hoodie. I play ARPGs. That's it. <laughs> uh yeah i'm subtractum i primarily do poe stuff but i have played all of the other arpgs and i do play them once in a while and yeah i'm I'm the old guy in the chat i guess so i have a little bit different perspective than the young guys sometimes <laughs> what was your first arpg that you've played ever subtractum uh i mean did i play anything before diablo one i don't know but i mean i played diablo one when i was in high school so uh, the other one is still something, there. yeah. <laughs> I yeah. thought you were like 28 or something. When I met you in person, uh, I thought you were young. I will be 42 this year, yeah. No shot, yeah. dude. You're looking good for 40s. Looking for sure. good for 42, man. Oh, thanks. Yeah, did you stay in the basement? No sun? Heck yeah. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't beat Al Kaiser, I guess, but... Uh, <laughs> isn't that like this meme where Al Kaiser is like 52 or something? Like, where's that coming from, actually? But... <laughs> Okay, anyway, so thanks for the intro, guys, and myself, I'm Woody. Um, I mostly blast a lot of Diablo, especially D3, D4, I've done, like, at least content creation-wise, but personally, I've also been enjoying a lot of Path of Exile and recently last Epoch, so I'm very much looking forward to Path of Exile 2, and I figured it was a good time to host the podcast to talk about all of these games together, basically, here with some of the bigger content creators. So I have a list of topics here. We want to go through um, PoE, Necropolis League, and our plans and so on. Then we want to talk about PoE 2 and uh, also what we think about the delay, the beta, and you know whatever else. Then I want to talk a bit about D4 and also the Season 4 updates. Then about Last Epoch, so I guess everyone here has played that, right? And then we're going to talk about kind of like the, the combined topic of all of these games together, like, you know, also what is on the horizon and basically open end discussion after that. So that's kind of the... The timeline that we have here for the next two hours or so. So, yeah, starting with PoE. So I guess it's like the big topic right now. Everyone is kind of getting ready, I guess, with uh, the PoE League. Personally, I've also been doing a bit of uh, like league start practice now and stuff, kind of getting back into the game after <laughs> barely playing it really lately. So, um, yeah, what do you guys think about the announcements? Maybe let's start with that. Which announcement you want to start with? Yeah, the, the Necropolis. There's a lot like, of them. Yeah, the Necropolis League, basically. So that's what I want to start with, first of all. This is like the most immediate topic, I guess. It struck me as a large amount of content for one league expansion. I was surprised by how many both quality of life changes we got, how cool the mechanics seemed. Um, I haven't been around for too many leagues, so maybe this is like par for the course for them. But as it, like my second league launch I've been part of, it's... It's way larger than I was expecting for a league. I, I maybe subtract them. You're probably the OG here. What did you think about the league launch? Yeah, um, I, I love that you said that. Uh, that's why, yeah, I mean, PoE to me, like they spoil us. Um, in terms of the content, like I would say, yeah, the quality of life stuff is a little out of normal for them, <laughs> if we're going to be perfectly honest, uh, dumping all that on us. But in terms of the size of the league, this is probably about average maybe a little bit above average previously actually they used to once a year do an entire end game rework you can look up previous atlases like currently we have the atlas passive tree back in the day they used to be very very different where it's like okay you got shaper versus elder and you're like manipulating them around or you had to connect collect like 32 different stones and summon all these different bosses that then would summon cirrus um they used to do that like once a year once every year and a half and yeah, this is just kind of par for the course where they spoil us with a very large mechanic rework that gives you something to really bite into for a few months. So yeah, um, I'm pretty excited for it. It's cool that they're doing another crafting league. Those are always kind of, uh, they, don't, they haven't done very many. Harvest was the original one, and it's always 
potentially contentious with the complexity there and what it actually does, particularly versus Affliction League last uh, last league, the current one, where it was a big uh, like a big currency <laughs> big currency dump um, <laughs> versus now engaging in in crafting and all that. But I, I really appreciate the contrast. Yeah. yeah, one of the things. Oh, go ahead, Woody. Now I was just going to say, like, it kind of like struck me just now that uh, I guess both DM and Rex have not really played that much PoE before, like you know, like the most recent leagues, and like you know what Subtraction just tell, told us with like you know the expansions of the Atlas and the new end games and stuff like that it hasn't really happened in a while, right? And I guess might not even happen again. I'm not sure if they ever said anything about more of that coming in the future now that PoE two is coming. Do we actually know anything about it, Subtraction? Or anyone else in chat? Is there like anything they hinted at that something is coming again? But about big endgame rework? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, I was just talking with my chat yesterday. And we we're like, we're on. <laughs> we're like, when is four point coming out? We're on three point twenty four now, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's it's uh, very interesting that they've kind of been going down this path and just kind of iterating. And the uh, like that to me, the Atlas passive tree has been like the beta, the biggest blessing and the biggest curse because it's such a dynamic, great system that they're encouraged more to always stick with it and improve on it, which is like it's a good thing. It's great. It's a great system. But I kind of miss the old. All right, we're going to throw everything away and do something crazy and, you know, whole new game. Um, and I, I feel my instinct is that because of PoE2, they've been kind of stretched a little bit due to that. They're. Um, you know, they're kind of split resources and they're just kind of like more iteration on what they have right yeah. now instead of like big, big reworks. Yeah, Chad is saying that apparently they're de they are developing PoE 2 first and then they're going to devote more resources to PoE 1. So maybe you're going to see like, you know, a 4.0 at some point, I guess, maybe next year or something. But Rex wanted to say something. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, Rex was going to talk for a while already. Sorry. <laughs> Let's go with Rex. I mean well, I mean, it's okay, but the thing that I want to add here that I, I love about grinding gear games that, and everything that they do, they seem to do this very consistently. It's like, imagine if you were working at grinding gear games and on the whiteboard, they had an idea, all right, we're going to do a Necropolis League. It's like, okay, there might be some dead guys, there might be some bear, the guys that we bury, but they... They go seem to go all in with the idea every single time. Like, all right, you're going to kill them, and then we're going to cart them away to the morgue, and you're going <laughs> to see all their bodies there. Then you're going to bury them, and then you're going to dig them back up and craft with it. It's like the, the level of the level of detail and ingenuity and just the creativity that they have is insane, and it's consistently insane. And, you know, even if the league doesn't go perfectly, like some people are upset that it sounded like in their discussion that they're going to like force the league mechanic on you and all the zones. It's like, ooh, I don't really know if I want that for the campaign, but I can forgive those things when I see the amount of effort that they put into making it great. That's something that I always respect out of these guys. 100%. I, I always like to say I'd rather them risk having a bad league by just going all out and being creative versus doing something safe and, and kind of boring, just kind of mid. So yeah, I, like Lake of Calandra, most people hated it, but Lake of Calandra gave us Sentinel League, right? Like <laughs> we had arguably one of the worst leagues and then arguably one of the best leagues. And I'd rather have the highest highs and, you know, not that low lows. It was still playable versus just everything mid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it reminds me of as like this like parody video from like many years ago where they, where like they, someone is like impersonating the devs and he's like, dude, like do you guys know that? Like where where they like you know take like he's like imitating taking drugs and then like you know the creativity part that Rex was <laughs> alluding to like you know like you know like he's smoking and like dude, yeah, what if we do this and like skill trees have been skill trees, you know? Like, <laughs> there's a video like that. It's glorious. Yeah. So some people might know that. But yeah, it's kind of like the, the creativity part that uh, Rax is alluding to. And uh, I really like that about PoE as well. Like they do crazy stuff and I see it again with Necropolis. And I'm really excited for the crafting myself. I think DM wanted to say something earlier. What was that? I was just going to go back because we were talking about PoE 2 and about in-game add additions to PoE 1. And I was going to say, my understanding of that is the gentleman, I believe Mark Roberts, who made the PoE 1 in-game bosses, like the Uber Pinnacles, etc., is the one who is creating the PoE 2 bosses. And so his focus is there. And I was just going to add on to the pile and say, yeah, so I'm sure that more in-game would probably come in PoE 1 once the gentleman who's making the in-game for PoE 1 is done working on PoE 2. It kind of makes sense. 
Yeah, but I guess on the other hand, we you know have like you know like a small team, I guess, of people that actually like you know mostly flesh out the end game currently in PoE two, but then they also want to keep building on PoE two, I guess, right? And probably pretty rapidly. So, so will that really work out that way without really recruiting more people and you know like then also like onboarding them like you know long enough so that they actually get into the groove of making new stuff for the existing game? I think that might be a bit too optimistic, maybe. But. You know, I don't even, I'm not really, so I'm I'm very, very new to PoE, so this might be like a brand new Andy take on this, but I don't even think it's working out badly for grinding gear games, because instead of getting these, like, uh, again, these additional massive endgame revamps, that is not where PoE is lacking, in my opinion, and it looks like they've been able to go back to some of their systems and improve a lot of the quality of life for the masses that people have been begging for for a very long time. So to me, it's it's almost kind of a win-win. They can allocate resources to PoE2 because their end game is already so in-depth, and we're getting the quality of life stuff that a lot of people are asking for. I'm not even mad about this situation at all, but maybe it's just because I'm very new to the whole thing. Oh, yeah. No, like, uh, in terms of me being disappointed they haven't done an end game rework, it's, I'm at like a 9 out of 10 instead of 10 out of 10. It's like, <laughs> it's still like, yeah. all right, yeah, everything looks awesome. I'm, I'm not mad. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's really like that the current end game is bad or anything like that. It's just more like you're kind of excited for like something new at some point, right? I guess it's mostly what it is. Like, okay, like we have Maven forever. We had, you know, the Elvish bosses forever. And, you know, like what is like kind of the next big guy, you know, the next big boss or maybe like some new type of item or whatever, right? That is kind of like... A, what such an endgame revamp would entail and yeah i guess you know the game is over in a good state but something fresh would be nice but i guess that fresh thing will just be poe2 then whenever it comes we so did. i feel like we potentially did get some freshness to the end game in poe1 right didn't they actually add a couple new uber bosses yeah uh, the this stuff league. Cool. yeah 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 so we got literally a new tier map and then we got a rework in the way that the uber bosses work with fragments etc which i thought was a great change for the economy again i'm new so i'm figuring this stuff out but it seemed like it was a problem at least i ran into it's like why would i run normal variants off of uber based pricing if i'm playing trade for instance so i liked i kind of liked those reworks i thought they were pretty fundamentally good changes at least from what i could tell yeah for sure i agree with that i'm actually very happy to see like that is like this you know um like switch between uber and normal bosses and also like loot basically right i think that was like a huge mistake i guess that they made there like personally i wasn't really like a big boss farmer but i was like you know i saw it immediately back when they made these uber bosses and i was like okay everyone's gonna find the uber bosses now because it's just better and that's exactly what turned out and now they finally fixed that so i'm glad to see that this was actually changed agreed yes but yeah, I, personally, get, I'm also excited for the T70 maps. It sounds like these maps themselves are already going to be quite a challenge. And then there's also like a boss attached to the to that map, right? It's going to be like some kind of like, I guess not exactly a boss, but it's probably pretty, pretty tough. So sounds like, you know, it's definitely something exciting to like dive into. Yeah, agreed. I'm looking forward to the challenge, though. I, it, I, it will make it a little bit harder, I feel like, right, to get to Uber bosses on solo cell phone. Now you got to do it through the tier 17s, but I guess that's part of it. It'll be kind of fun to see if it's possible for me, especially my starter got nerfed. I guess Bone Shatter is not exactly in the best in the best state right now. I don't know how overhyped that's going to be, but I heard that that got nerfed a little bit. You guys know your starters? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so well, what is ready. it? <laughs> Um, yeah, I was originally going to do a uh, ball lightning mana stacking and, uh, everyone's like, I was planning that weeks ago and then, uh, the rework to Archmage actually made it potentially a really, really good starter. And because I just have the, the hipster in me, <laughs> it actually made me want to play it less weirdly enough. So I'm actually going back to my Frostblink ignite build that I'm going to be making a max roll guide for it anyway. And I, I really like to play the same build that I made the max roll guide for, cause I can kind of play along with people that are following it and that's going to be uh that's just a really fun solid build just ignite elementalist as an archetype is really really strong you know the most popular one in like hardcore soul cell found would be detonate dead it's just a very powerful archetype for you know early game league start it's just uh just really really efficient sounds fun yeah i heard about ball lightning and archmage being potentially really strong so that sounds exciting i've never played ball lightning myself but personally i'm actually planning to do dd i've never played it and I want to go hardcore and try to do all the Ubers this time. 
Uh, I've done them on softcore a bunch of times, but never on hardcore, so I figured this would be like a good league to try it. Uh, especially with the tier 17 stuff, so I'm going for that. Nice. Yeah. So I'm very, very clueless, and I'm getting pulled in every single direction. What, what I really wanted to do, one of the most fun builds that I've ever played in my very limited time, is Bone Shatter Jug. That's what I wanted to play. I played it in the Gauntlet. I loved it. I wanted to uh, play it a lot more this league. And then I watched Karn's video, and that made me very sad, because Karn made it sound like the world is ending, and Karn's a smart guy. So now I'm crying, and uh, my chat's telling me, Bone Shatter's not even that good for bossing anyway. Then they say the best choice is Detonate Dead, but don't play Detonate Dead because everyone plays Detonate Dead. <laughs> so go play this build, and then a 300 chatter say that build's dog shit. Play this build, and then the other 300 say no, that one's dog shit. And it's just like, um, I, I'm very confused. I have no idea what to do. I have no idea. What was the nerf so huge to Bone Shatter? What, what happened exactly? I'm not 100% It's pretty aware. rough. Yeah, it's pretty rough. So, I mean, they go on, Rex. I think one of the problems is, is that the war cries used to be, if I'm understanding this correctly, the war cries used to be instant from the passive tree, and now you have to grab it from a gem, and there's also a mana cost reservation. So it's a mana issue, and it's a gem issue, and mm. those are two things that Bone Shatter really has almost no ways to solve. Yeah, okay, and you I see got that. socket pressure. You just run out of sockets, really, unfortunately, at the moment. Yeah, the left mouse thing and all that automation stuff is they they said it. They said that uh is it was a miss. There there's solutions to it. It's like yesterday I did a I did a test run um just to act 5 and I I made sure I didn't put my steel skin on left click anymore and I was putting it on W and it was just you could feel it was just a mechanical downgrade to uh to playing. It was like, "Okay, well I can wait until I can get cast one damage taken." But normally, steel skin, you also want to use it to remove bleed. And it was just so convenient to have it on left click. And like, yeah, the automation supports there. But like, like Rax was saying, like the sac socket pressure, mana cost, it just it just feels worse. It's just overall feeling worse, um, yeah. which, which is unfortunate because those those support gems are cool. They enable some really cool things like brand recall looks insane. Um, there's going to be some really fun stuff on like uh, Saboteur with brand recall. But yeah, it just that was a real weird solution. I get what they're trying to do, because like, in what game do you just put a main, a primary skill on your left click as like a, and you know, a mechanical workaround? But I, I always viewed it as like a quirky thing about Path of Exile that was like kind of fun and interesting. But I guess they didn't like it. Yeah, I mean, personally, I'm kind of on board with the change, but I think what I should have done is like make the gem actually good. You know, like it seems like it's just a nerf, right? Like you have like the same like I think it even has like reduced cooldown recovery rate or something as well, right? It's, it's actually just a nerf using that gem compared to before where I didn't need a gem, and you had the auto cast. And you know if they had made the gem like an actual upgrade, I guess it wouldn't be so bad. You know if like your your cooldowns were faster instead or maybe some other perk, right? That could have been some stuff. And now it's just kind of like yeah, like everything just that you start just feels worse now. I guess so. That's kind of the main downside here. I guess it's mostly a tuning issue if you ask me. I don't really have an issue with with the left click removal as much because I'm newer, so I haven't had leagues of me like getting so used to it that I feel the impact of it being removed. The one that hurts for me is the war cry because like I did bone shatter jug last time, I liked it a lot. It was the farthest I got, so I want to do bone shatter again. It's the instant notable that got removed for the war cry. That's the one that like I'm I'm feeling a little mm -hmm. bit more than the than necessarily the left click. Yeah, change. the in. But the, the instant instant note is really nice. I agree with that. So losing that is very sad. I I agree. <laughs> so just to kind of like reiterate here, like the high level thinking, when grinding gear game says, "Hey, we want to remove this mechanic where you left click and you cast skills because it's not intuitive. A new player would never pick up on this unless they essentially saw someone else doing that." I I a thousand percent agree with removing these bizarre mechanics that probably shouldn't have never been there in the first place. It was so weird to learn about it when I came into Poe and I force move. And you can't rebind left click. So I'm using X mouse to map my left click to force move my side mouse button <laughs> and then binding the buff on left click in order to even play. You're, you feel like a velociraptor, you know, you're you're playing this, this super weird setup. I don't mind them fixing that. It's just sometimes, you know, if this happens to everybody is sometimes you win and sometimes you miss on the solutions. 
One thing that this is one of the scenarios where I don't have it in my mind. I think a lot of people think this, that content creators feel like they have all the answers all the time. They don't. And a content, being a content creator does not mean that you are a developer either. A lot of the content creators, like myself, for example, might be the worst game developers ever. But I have seen multiple times for other games where a company is trying to fix a problem, like, and it's going to have a big impact to the community, and they'll run it by the content creators. And a lot of them, you know, after seeing this announcement, were instantly able to pick apart why it bricks so many things. So I think one thing that Grinding Gear Games could have done is maybe asked a few more content creators what kind of an impact would this have on all these different builds and will this be fine to solve because it sounds like a lot of them picked up on it right away me not being one of them um that it's going to break a lot of stuff yeah i think in, that's something that in general gg could probably do more of right i'm not sure exactly how how they like beta and alpha testing of leaks works but i know they have like some small testing program that's like secret but i think most of the content creators are not actually part of that right they probably have like some kind of a like small player program or something. But yeah, it seems like sometimes these things kind of like get through the cracks and then it makes it into the game and everyone just hates that change, right? And <laughs> you could have avoided it, I guess. So uh, I think that's yeah. a good point that Rex is making. That's like, for example, something that um, I guess Blizzard probably does a bit better there, where at least from my personal experience, you know, being like, you know, Diablo, like, you know, having a like Diablo affinity and, and Diablo, Diablo partner program free, and stuff. Least. Yeah, in Diablo 3, Diablo we always 3. had these, these roundtables, and there was like, you know, Rax and me and some other guys uh, chilling with, with the developers very often, and we would, we would talk about stuff, and, you know, very often there would actually be some actually good changes coming out of that to the game. So, yeah, or like, at the very least, it would prevent a catastrophe. <laughs> like, like that, that would happen. So, yeah, I guess that there could be, like, you know, some better, like, consultancy earlier. Maybe with with uh, content creators or players, or like uh, you know, high level players it doesn't have to be content creators necessarily, right? I'm not sure how GG does that. Yeah, it's like the one counterpoint I would say there is because the Path of Exile game is such a large sandbox, and this is the way they view it: is they will purposely add items that they have no idea if they have any use in the game, and they will just toss them in there. And many times it'll be like three years later. There'll be one patch note and then some <laughs> someone will remember that like, oh, this item was really bad before. But because of this one patch note, it actually I can combine these items and get like a zero percent cooldown and break the game. And that's like the way that they view the game as well, where it's a sandbox and they are willing to absolutely break things. Try to you know try not to make things blow up the servers or anything, um, but they're willing to make those kind of changes. So, for example, they've made changes in the past where uh, it will, like, uh, one of the most common League stars, I mean, the most recent example to me is Impending Doom, uh, where they change the way that Awakened Spell Cascade works, and you can't get the same overlaps that you used to as easily, and it, it literally made it not a viable League starter, and we didn't know, it was, like, one of the most common ones, it was getting hyped up, and they just deleted the build from the game, effectively. <laughs> and they actually, like, so many people had League started it, that they, everyone cried after, you know, I guess, verifiable error. <laughs> uh and justifiably everyone cried that leak started for the first day and then they're like okay we're gonna undo that change for this leak but it's gone next this build is gone next leak it is gone um because we don't like the way that this interaction works and they are willing to just say hey this is the direction we want to take the way that these things work uh yeah you played this one build for a while but they don't view any build as sacrosanct it is always like hey this was a cool thing you were able to play it like cold dot cold dot is one of the most core builds that has been around forever it blew my mind that they just said yeah vortex no longer good on left click like you can't do it and that was like one of the core things that made it comfy to play um like they're just willing to make those really big changes like yeah. how much they like triple nerf tornado shot this league that that came out of like tornado shot's <laughs> always been that good and that like the fact that they're willing to just nerf it like that and leave detonate dead like what the hell anyway um yeah i think they view the game differently and the the builds differently than other developers that might be like, okay, well, we need a good fire build for the Sork. The Sork needs a good fire build. So we're gonna, you know, this is, we have to make sure that every skill is viable. GGG is gonna be like, yeah, no, that, that skill sucks. Deal with it. Like, yeah, don't use it. Yeah, just, <laughs> just, wait don't, don't they, it. Uh, just wait until they delete Righteous Fire from the game and then, then we'll see what happens, I guess. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's what they did last week. That's exactly what they did. Wait, isn't um, that, wait, really? Is, is it not a thing right now or what? You know, it's in yeah. the game, but they they drastically reworked it in a way that it is not remotely as comfortable as a league starter. 
Oh, like man. yeah you okay. look it up watch watch like the old videos from last league with pox and captain lance like okay. oh, crafting how to still league start it i wasn't like, actually aware with, of um, yeah okay did they nerf <laughs> I mean, like butter boy too like the the sentinel guy and <laughs> radiant they, they nerfed yeah. radiance again right on this yeah, yeah i mean i would i was the SRS guardian guy right and they uh yeah that that felt really bad i put so much work into that that um max roll guide and that's the one we were reviewing it uh, a couple days ago in the meeting that's the one build that we're like everyone's like this one's fine this one's fine this one's fine we got to srs and i'm like god damn it all right yep archive it it's uh <laughs> it got nerfed um yeah not not just the not just the radiant sentinel but srs as, as well lost 38 percent damage and like oof poison's still fine but that's not as easy as a league starter and another thing again to i would say to grinding gears credit i have a lot of respect for a company that has a vision and has done enough work with within their own game to have the confidence to say this is what we're doing you know some of the other titles that you know are having different visions all the time those haven't ended up in as good of a spot and i think woody mentioned a comment that is also very very critical i actually had a conversation with some people from ehg on this recently if you are going to seek community feedback it does not need to be a content creator it doesn't need to be someone who has a Twitch or a YouTube or anything like that. There are a lot of very, very godly theory crafters that might be on the forums or whatever, or on the, uh, on the discords that you could, that might actually be better testers or analyzers of these in-depth patch notes than a lot of the content creators. So I thought that point was extremely important, um, to consider everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially like in PoE where you have like, you know, races and, uh, you know, like you actually have like, you know, these, these letters, like gauntlets, whatever they can, can literally just like send a message to like the top 10 guys in a race or something and say, Hey, you want to test the next patch for us or something? Like, I guess a lot of people would say yes. Right. Like, I mean, they could just keep Ben on speed dial for GGG. <laughs> <laughs> they could just call him up and he'll answer all the questions. That's fine. Um, I guess even, even Ben probably doesn't know like every single thing about every single thing. right? I, I wouldn't say that. I don't know. <laughs> I talked to him for a few minutes. Uh, he was in the car on the way home to LAX. And dude, the amount I learned just from sitting next to him was like infinitely more than Twitch chat over the last entire league. Oh, just Twitch the amount chat of would be dumber. Wow, yeah, yeah, direct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> direct. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, ben, ben is very special. He's incredibly smart. Smart guy. Yeah, I always love listening to him as well. Like, you know, and also like seeing him in the gondola races when he starts explaining some stuff here and there. It's, it's very, very amazing. I'm also a big fan of Ben, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, do we have anything else you want to discuss about PoE 1 right now and the upcoming league? So we talked about the starters uh, and... I, I want, I'm curious about whether or not you guys think, because I saw Ziz say it didn't look like an SSF league. My reaction, I'm sure Ziz knows more than me, but my reaction looking at it was like, oh, this looks like great for SSF. Now I can like try to make you know gear with the crafting league. So I wanted to ask you guys, what do you think about this league's crafting mechanics specifically for SSF? Well, I'm actually considering Hardcore SSF instead of Hardcore Trade, but either way, I will craft all of my own gear, and I think it looks great. Like, you know, if this new crafting mechanic actually turns out really effective, it sounds really fun. Like, you know, you collect your stuff maybe for, like, you know, a day or two, or and then you do, like, you know, three, four crafts, and you have, like, very high chances of getting something good. It sounds fun, and, um, you know, much, be much better than, like, spamming Chaos Orbs and whatever, and or, like, you know, Alteration Spam and then crafting, whatever. So that could work out pretty well if, if if you can combine these different effects. So I'm excited for it. And also with the multiple Atlas skill trees, uh, it's going to be really cool to like, okay, I'm going to farm, you know, a bunch of like Essence and um, Expedition now, and then I'm going to farm a bunch of like Legions and Breach here. And, you know, they can like swap it around all the time. I'm very excited for that as well. So personally, I'm hyped for the SSF or nearly SSF. I guess my my take on it is the way that I'm approaching the game being very, very new to PoE is I'm trying to learn as much as I can, as fast as I can. I just want to get better at the game. Um, it was a lot of fun running around on my tornado shot guy, it, pentakilling every single map and getting, you know, <laughs> 60 divine orbs here, two mage bloods over here. But... At a certain point, I stopped learning because all I was doing was just repeatedly just deleting these jungle valleys. When the gauntlet came out and I had to actually play SSF and it was it was hardcore and it was under these super difficult parameters, 
I was actually forced to learn the campaign. I was forced to learn all the boss fights. And the second that I got to maps, I, I needed to figure out a way to get really good gear running low level maps and doing all the different mechanics that I had previously skipped on my Atlas tree just to even progress. So I feel like going hardcore SSF will teach me more, but then it, every time I say that, my chat just says, no, 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 you can learn actually way more by going trade league, and that still doesn't make any sense to me. So um, <laughs> I, I appreciate the crafting, and I, I'll take all the help I can get, believe me, but I'm thinking go, to go hardcore SSF just because I think it's better to learn the game? Question mark? I don't know. Well, you learn different things in, in, in those modes, right? Like in, in softcore, you just have the economy, the dying doesn't matter, you play different builds, you have a way different outlook on the game, I guess, and then have a hardcore where you actually have to learn like the game as in the mechanics, right? You look at the bosses, you look at the moves, you you figure out how to make your gear, like as you said. So it's like, it's just a completely different game, basically. So this is, you know, this is one game and this is the other game, basically. <laughs> so that's my perspective I mean, on it, at least. Yeah, chat chat saying that you learn more in trade versus SSF is just wrong. <laughs> um, like SSF absolutely forces you to reach out into different parts of the game, figure out what, like, hey, how do I? I need a lightning coil. How do I get that? Like, oh, okay, look up. Okay, is this div card? I can farm cemetery. Cool, I can get that div card in cemetery, and now I can get my lightning coil. And like, and then force like, oh, I need I need to understand how to get the betrayal unveils and do all that type of stuff. Um, you know, hardcore versus softcore. I think hardcore will force you to learn, you know, defenses, of course, and it'll force you to learn um, patience and reading. <laughs> um, oh, I can't yeah, read. I, Never mind. Softcore it is. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but SSF, I think, particularly if you're curious, willing to put the time in, once you have a foundation of the game, I encourage everyone to try SSF. Uh, like occasionally, at the very least, it will always make you a better player. So, yeah, I think that's just a, a bad take on chat. Yeah, the SSF, I feel like, was teaching me a lot very quickly. Like, even things like recipes, like learning how to put physical percentage damage on an item right from the get-go using the vendor. That was something I would have, you know, if I'm trade, like, why would I ever need to know that? You know, I'm not trying to, like, craft an Uber item and then trade it. So, um, yeah, SSF for sure felt like it was teaching me more very quickly. I had to force myself to interact with mechanics I otherwise don't want to. Because in trade, I would just farm... Whatever makes me the most money, I'll just farm up and buy what I want. But now I'm like, ah, oh, goddammit, I have to do Harvest, for instance. Yeah. I guess, again, it depends on, like, you know, what you're actually trying to get out of the game. Like, most people are softcore trade enjoyers. And, yeah, like, you know, the knowledge that you find that you get in, in hardcore SSF is not one-to-one -one applicable, I guess. So this is probably why chat has these takes. But I can also see that, you know, what Sap said. Like... You just learn more about the game in general, and you, you figure out things. And even if they are not really relevant in a trade league, you know, like you would never go and farm lightning coil card necessarily or something in a trade league, I guess, right? You just try to get the lightning coil from trade, and that's it. But it's good to have that knowledge anyway, just you know, in case, and you can get a bit of better reference for like where is everything, how do you get everything, in case you ever want to go and farm it. Yeah, I mean, you can make the argument as well, just to make a an excuse for a softcore trade that. You know, interacting with the economy, understanding that type of stuff. That is that is part of the game, right? Like it's <laughs> you can't just say that that's not a skill in the game or anything. There are people that just I sit here and I alteration spam certain things and I make mirrors doing that. And that is a thing that is the game. Um, you know, the kind of the beauty, the beauty of ARPGs is that you set your own goals and you can make your own choice in within that. And there are people that arguably win the game by never leave, leaving their hideout, accruing mirrors, and then <laughs> buying alt arts in standard. Like that, that is a way to play the game. Um, so yeah, it's all it's all valid if you're long as long as you're having fun. Yeah, well said, I guess. Okay, I think we can move on to um, the next topic though, unless someone else has any last comments about PoE one in the Necropolis League. So I want to talk about PoE two. And, uh, well, we have at least two people here that actually got to play it lately in Los, uh, Los Angeles. Um, I'm not sure if they invited Rex. I guess they also invited you, but I know that he didn't go. And personally, I also didn't go. Uh, it was just, like, too far for me. And, like, I, I decided, like, you know, 30-hour travel one way is <laughs> it's a bit rough for, like, chilling with the boys for an afternoon. So I was like, okay, I'm going to play two months later in the beta anyway. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep, get screwed. Yeah, yeah. Guess what? Eight months from now. Yeah. You snooze, you lose, Woody. Yeah, unfortunate. 
<laughs> but yeah, um, maybe uh, especially the MN subject, and we can like maybe talk a bit about um, your experiences. I also been watching like a lot of your uh, the videos that people put out. I think I watched the M. Uh, I'm not sure if I watched Subtractum, but um, yeah, a bunch of people put out like their their playthroughs and talked about them, and it was really cool to see. But maybe you can give us some more like you know hands-on experience that you gathered. Sure. You want to go first, Subtractum, or should I? Ah, right, go ahead. Sure. Uh, so in the beginning. I didn't have, we didn't have a lot of time. So like I was actually in LA less than 24 hours and the amount of time that we had of actual gameplay was about four and a half hours. And I want to preface like everything I say by the fact that we only were able to get part of the way through act two. I don't know if anyone actually made it to act three, maybe somebody did, but for me, myself personally, made it all the way through act one, part of the way through act two. And uh, because of that, I think our experience is like fairly limited. We didn't, we still don't really know much about in game in PoE 2, if like really anything at all at this point. I don't know if maybe I missed something, but I haven't seen the discussion much. So most of our experience was only sort of early game. Um, but overall, I just to give you a general take on it, I thought I was going to like PoE 2, but I was unsure. But after playing it, I left being like, I'm really going to like this game. Like it is actually highly enjoyable just from a gameplay perspective. I found me enjoying each individual fight more than I enjoy each individual fight in Path of Exile 1, for instance. And I felt like they kind of focused on different things, whereas the combat feels like you intentionally need to be knowing what you're doing in terms of like positioning and fighting, like literally every fight. To give you an example of this, for instance, surrounding is like a thing, right? So you can get surrounded and then die like it's D2 again. So I found myself <laughs> having to like focus much more than I ever really had to in, in almost any other ARPG at the moment. So, I mean, my initial impression of it was like, it's hard and I like that. And easily the best thing in it is like the boss fights are fantastic. I mean, from the from the beginning, like all of the boss fights are really good, like surprisingly good. So, I, I mean, I have nothing but pretty much good things. There's some complaints I have for sure, but mostly I'm going to have positive things to say as we get into it. Yeah, what, what class did you play again? Play Warrior. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I hundred percent echo basically all of that with the, uh, unfortunate, uh, downside is that I played Sork yeah. and the Sork <laughs> is unfortunately, it's just very undertuned. So like, it's a thing that they can fix. Um, I think they will fix yeah. it. The feel of the skills, the look and feel of them is really cool. Uh, like it's very combo and this is just, it's so contentious for POE one people. Um, but I, I, so the game is very uh, intentional. Like Dark Souls is a very fair comparison with this game where you actually like walk forward. They start an attack. You actually back up. You can roll. You can dodge roll actually through something like you actually like Bloodborne skills actually translate where, OK, I actually want to roll into them under their arm and then hit them from behind. And you, you actually have this real intentional gameplay that's very thoughtful. But the. Uh, coming from traditional ARPGs. Like, I, I think it's awesome that they're making such a big change, but I don't know how that translates into a blasting game at the end. And like, it, can they keep that and keep that soul of that and make it fun for doing hundreds and hundreds of hours with that much intentional gameplay? Like, I've, I love Souls games and I've beaten most of them multiple times at this point, but I don't want to sit there and grind Dark Souls 1. I'm not Lobos Jr. Like, I'm not going to grind Dark Souls 1 for 12 hours a day every single day and i think that's that's um if if they keep that feel all the way into the end game where because like the, the the actual like white mobs and the trash mobs were an experience like that was a, a very different experience like I, my comparison was undead berg in dark souls one where your first experience you like you walk up the stairs there's the bridge right there and you're like all right i'm just gonna walk across the bridge and there's two skeletons to your side that if you don't take them out or you don't know how to dodge roll their arrows that are coming in, you're just done. You're just dead right there. You get stun locked on the bridge. You're like, well, F this game, uninstall them out. And but if you, you know, you stick through it and you push through, you figure out how to take on the encounter, um, you know, it's very satisfying. And that's such a different mental shift for from how we usually play these ARPGs where trash mobs are scary. Yeah, just as DM said, like you will get surrounded. Like I had a clip in my playthrough where uh, a couple guys were coming to, from my side. I turned backwards. I started walking backwards, throwing my fireballs. And then five werewolves jumped on my back and just instantly killed me. And yeah, everything is always scary. At least in Act 1, everything is always scary all the time. It's it's a different game. I had a lot of fun with it, but I, I uh, they're taking uh, you know a risk. And I think it's a cool risk, but mm -hmm. they're taking a risk by diverging so much from the traditional formula. I'd yeah. be curious. To... Sorry, go on, Bluey. 
Oh, I was just going to say, like, I, I've watched, like, you know, I don't know, like, 10 different content creators now or something, like, you know, with this um, playthrough and also, like, some of the other clips that we had, like, with, like, some Druid clip and Hunter's clips from back then and stuff like that. And it definitely looks like this, like, really slow, really tough game that you have experienced in Act 1 seems to, like, progress very quickly, though. Like, we saw this, for example, like, I, I watched Akaiser, he, he went into Act 2, he got Leap Slam, and then he started Leap Slamming into packs. He was, like, three times faster than before, one-shotting packs with Leap Slam, which was my, maybe overtuned or something, but, like, even if he didn't one-shot them, he would stun them, and everything was suddenly much safer. And then this whole, like, you know, this active, like, dodging and, like, you know, this positional combat definitely kind of takes a step back at that moment, I think, like what Subtractum just explained. And I think it's kind of cool that they're starting with this kind of like, you know, very, very kind of like slow, really tough kind of combat, which, okay, might be too tough with what we saw right now. Uh, you know, you don't want to like, you know, make people quit right away, but it, you're going to feel the progression much more. There's a lot more room for progression, right? So even if like late game, it translates into like this blast mode, PoE 1 style, where you like, you know, maybe not blow up entire screens at once, but you know, like you're going to one shot most trash and you're going to go at a really fast pace, maybe like, you know, two or three times as fast as at the start. Um, you know, you, you can have a lot of this like blast mode, like gameplay later, and you're going to have like a real nice progression curve, right? Where you actually like, go step by step and like, okay, now you unlock, unlock that skill and now you get your free link and now you get your four link. And you know, like you have to see that most of these playthroughs were actually done on a one link, right? Like you imagine you go into PoE 1 and you have a one link skill and it's basically ruthless, right? Where you just like whack away at enemies and everything is super dangerous. So yeah. I think if they don't make it too hard to survive, but you know, kind of like, you know, have this like uh, intentional combat moves and dodging and, you know, there's a bit of back and forth and then later on it kind of like takes a step back, but you still do it like sometimes on the boss fights or sometimes then it's a big rap pack but not on every single trash monster, I think that would probably feel really good, actually, because there's going to be, like, these moments where it's like, okay, now I have to pay attention, but otherwise you're kind of, like, blasting. And if, you know, if they find, like, the right frequency of that, it's going to feel really cool, I think. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, Waz was... Wazzy felt... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, Wazzy Waz felt so good, like, actually feeling like I had direct control over my character. And Agreed. like, I just wish I had a controller. Like, I actually think on a controller, a twin stick, feet up on the desk, would have just been really, really fun to lean back and play like just a normal action feeling game. Agreed. Yes. I think uh, I think there is a little bit of danger here. I think this is something that Poe Two should be looking at very, very carefully, especially for like the launch of their game. So one of the one of the biggest problems with Path of Exile which I'm sure grinding gear games would like to solve, at least in some form, is just to reach a broader audience. And, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why that people quit. It's too hard. The passive tree is too intimidated. The game's too bloated or whatever. There's not enough quality of life. Um, I think there is, and the devs said this, the devs said this in their, uh, in their talk on the couch when they said that they saw a lot of variance, which is what Subtractum and DM are saying, they're talking about between classes, but they also said between skills. And when I made the last Epoch Beginner's Guide, and when I made the Path of Exile Beginner's Guide, the, the way that I opened my Path of Exile Beginner's Guide videos, if it's your first time playing, you absolutely need a guide. If you don't have a guide, you're going to be doomed. But last Epoch, I said, that's not really true. You can pretty much pick any class, any skill, and just go for it, and it will kind of work. I think if a lot of people boot up Path of Exile 2 and it feels like Dark Souls 1, I think that's a huge problem. I'll be honest with you. Me personally, speaking as Rax, I would love that. I would love it to be extremely difficult. I would like every moment to feel terrifying if I'm playing hardcore SSF and have to really grind my way forward. Um, the, the progression of your character that Woody brought up is extremely important. You need to feel way better about your character after you play through a few acts than you do in the beginning. But I think it's going to be a very, very big problem if people are struggling in Act 1, all of the casuals that are using PoE2 as their way to jump into the franchise. I would be very, very careful about how hard I make the very beginning of the game. Otherwise, I think we're going to run into similar problems that we did for PoE 1. So uh, to address a couple of the points, 
So one of the things I noticed, and I'm, I'm just going to speak for myself, because like I, I didn't play Sorcerer. I heard that that was a very different experience in Brew, though, to be honest with you. Uh, but as a warrior, one thing I noticed was it wasn't necessarily the DPS was lower in POE 1 versus POE 2. It was the animations are slower, but the DPS stayed the same. That's what I know. So like I'm killing mobs pretty much as fast as I feel like in POE 1. If you make a new character on the beach right now with no twink gear or anything, you just start a new character, it's pretty damn slow. Unless you're really literally running past everything and you're racing, any new player is going to take forever to get even through Act 1. The other thing I noticed was by the time I get into Act 2 in POE 2, my character was ramping faster than my character would in literally POE 1. By the time I was in Act 2, I was one-shotting everything. One of the bosses, I literally killed in three hits. Like, I was just, I was going fast. And I didn't have, like, giga gear. I literally didn't have one ring, and I didn't have a belt. All my gear was blue. I had one, like, yellow glove that just had resistances. So I didn't have, like, crazy gear. I think where the issue may potentially arise is if in the late game you want to feel, like, strong, you're going to have the DPS. It's the animation casting time that makes it feel slow. But it feels to me like, okay, it takes me 2.32 seconds to cast Sunder, for instance. So while I'm casting that, the overall time for the DPS, it, I'm doing the same damage. It's like I'm literally one-shotting mobs. It's just that move takes so long to get out. That's the movement and the animations that are slower. So I'm not quite sure if it's like the base damage is higher for everybody. And then we're going to be focusing more on reducing like your casting animations. So that way you can kind of blast through. Or if you're going to have to really focus on like canceling animations. Because you could, for instance, rolling slam. I could do a two-hit slam. I do one, I roll out of the second slam, that way I could continue the move and it would cancel the slower second part of the animation. I was still one shot in anyway. So I don't know if like movement tech's gonna become a thing, but I definitely noticed that I felt like I was ramping. Even by act two, I was ramping and I don't know if it's a warrior thing in particular, but I was like one shotting literally everything with like half of my gear equipped. So I wasn't so, I wasn't as worried about it as I saw the progression happen. Sounds like barbarian flashbacks all over again, man. <laughs> From D4. Like it starts very slow and then suddenly you have your four weapons and you know kapow bonk and uh, that's it yeah. <laughs> the part that yeah felt i mean bad in, was... sorry go on oh yeah i was just gonna say in pew old school pew one we used to have an archetype <laughs> um that al kaiser used to play a lot uh but it's just out of the meta for a long time which was just use a very slow big two-handed weapon like we have this there there's a tag on certain uh attacks that might people might not know exists and it's called a slam attack <laughs> they just people don't really play them anymore and you would use a really big slow two-handed weapon you do your war cry so you could exert that attack and you do one gigantic slam you know sunder or earthquake or something and just destroy the entire screen light it on fire tectonic slam all that and it's a really cool archetype it's just very much out of the meta right now and yeah i wouldn't be surprised if they're just really trying to bring that back in poe2 as well yeah, personally, I'm a big enjoyer of slams, actually. I've, I've played some slam builds in the past as well. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, actually. What I saw from the Warrior, it looks really cool. And I think one thing that we have to keep in mind is also we only saw three classes now in this like latest preview that people got to play. And, I mean, there is Duelist that will have, you know, the steel skills and whatever, melee attacks. And those will be faster than those Warrior slams that we saw, right? And similar, we have, like, you know, like, a Ranger that maybe has, like, you know, a Radar Ascendancy that is also going to be melee themed. Or we have Shadow that is, wasn't there that would also have, like, dagger attacks. And I guess you, they, they intentionally made those slams really slow, that, like DM explained. But later on, you're also going to have extra attack speed to make it feel faster. But you still want to have, like, a baseline difference in the feel between those different builds and those different skills. And I think this is probably like why it is that the way it is, right? And if they can actually bring back this like super hard hitting, like just kind of slow play style, that, that is an archetype that is really fun. Like for example, this stuff like, what is this skill called? Perfect Strike, I think. Where like you charge it up and you release it at, a, at the right time, kind oh, of like the snipe skill. that was skill. so terrible. I hate man, that move, dude. I was I was looking at that skill and I was like, man, I really want to play this right now. Like this, this looks awesome, you know? Like I was like, you know, you charge it up, you release it at the right time. It's like, I don't know, it kind of reminds me, like there's like these old Need for Speed games, right? Where you have to like um, shift gears in the right moment to get like a speed boost or something. It was like, yeah, this is exactly like that, you know? Like you have to hit the timing. <laughs> and I was so looking forward to that actually. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Alk was saying that Perfect Strike is like a like a frame perfect one. Like there's one frame in there that just does like a billion damage, so it's quite literally a perfect strike. My biggest problem with the animations aren't so much like the damage that I do by the end of it, I'm totally satisfied with. One shot stuff. 
but the problem is you get interrupted so often. So you're trying to do like this literal two second casting animation, go make a sandwich while you're waiting on the thing. And then the bugs will walk up and like just tap. And it's like, oh, got to start yeah. over, I guess. And so you're rolling away. It. It, it, it was the canceling of animations that felt terrible. So maybe you need, you actually have to worry about a defensive layer of like stopping stuns or stagger or something in order to deal with that. Yeah, the, the incoming stunts definitely seemed like a problem. I think this is something that a lot of people complain about, and even just watching it, it seemed frustrating already. Like, personally, I, like we had exactly that discussion in Diablo 4 a lot. Right? When we went launched, a lot of people were complaining that monsters do so much crowd controls and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, it doesn't really seem that bad, but I guess people don't like getting CC'd, and then they nerfed it, and they nerfed it again, and they nerfed it again, and now we don't have CC's in the game, basically. But uh, in, in PoE 2, when, when I just watched that, I was like, okay, that definitely seems like too much. <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like, I guess, like, especially you haven't played it. Like, I'm not sure how was that for the Sorg, maybe, to subtract them. Oh, it was god awful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I was, that's funny that you say that. I was actually thinking of Rax's video, uh, like the early Diablo 4 video, like the number one problem in Diablo 4, they need to fix crowd control. And that's actually exactly what I was thinking of when I was playing Sorg. Because they had to, uh, yeah, every, because I'm a Sork as well, I, I have a little bit lower HP, and my, I'm supposed to be staying away at range. But I, I, was, I was like, okay, I'm going to use cold skills, I'm going to chill them, I'm going to freeze them. But I had like a literal two second cast time on some of my skills. Like the, one of the combos was throw a Frostbolt, and then you would cast an Ice Nova off the Frostbolt to try to freeze the enemies. But by the time, like the chill was so ineffectual. By the time the Frostbolt was in range to then start my Ice Nova cast time, there would be 10 bugs in my face. And I'd just be like, stun, stun, stun. Uh, and then I'd just like roll backwards and like, okay, that just gives them an opportunity to get behind me. And now I'm just surrounded. It, uh, yeah, Sork felt really bad. I think, I think they could attune that. I was talking with my friend last night, like, at what value, what value does stun, particularly in this context, really add when you're already taking the damage? Where, like, if you're strategically already positioning yourself properly, then, or if you improper improperly, your consequence can be taking damage, and you, like you'll die because you took that damage. But if you just get absolutely crowd controlled and you can't do anything about it, besides you shouldn't have even walked on that screen in the first place, where you didn't know there were ten bugs coming in your face, then it actually feels less strategic and just like super super punishing. So yeah, it could be like a cast speed thing, could be a damage thing, but the stuns in addition to that, oh god, it was it was rough. Yeah, so the like to add on to that, the entire idea of game development, right, is to create problems for the player to solve and solve them in cool and interesting ways. When subtractive is in act one, standing a football field away from the monsters, and he's playing ice to frost Nova them in place. And upon doing that combo, the result is 10 bugs in his face. And then what is the solution? You're constantly just constantly backpedaling in order to engage in a fight. That's uh, probably not what probably not what they're going for. So I say all this understanding, you know, this is a very, very early, early test. This is an alpha test. They literally said in the dev like couch interview that there's a lot of things that they want to change. They're actually delaying the beta because it's not at a point that they want it there. But Everything that I'm hearing, if I was a member of Grinding Your Games, I would find very, very concerning. It, the, literally everything that DM said, I would find concerning. Where, okay, I, I'm struggling in Act 1, but in Act 2, I can one-shot everything with bad gear. And by the way, I have this attack where it's like a dual hit, but I... I roll cancel mid animation because I only need the first part of my hit with bad gear to one-shot everything. Um, it and then the infinite stuns and then i have a three second cast to do one thing it's like it's so great that all of you guys love slam builds but i don't think the vast majority of people want to log in on warrior on day one and do a three second cast how many months have we spent in diablo 4 of people saying i'm so sick of doing generator 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 upheaval and i guess in poe2 at least it's killing them but the upheaval brings them to 70 percent, and then you go again generator 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 like the whole i haven't played it i understand it's an alpha they said it's a problem they're going to fix it but the whole user experience that you just described is just nothing but red flags to me that they need to address really funny that you mentioned that because 
Uh, the other issue that, that these are just my two main issues. I want to, I do want to say, I really think there's tons of potential. I think it's going to be a great game. But my other main issue was as Sork, the mana sustain was near zero. <laughs> I basically had to port back every other pack of oh, monsters God. to get my mana back. So you get a default little ding ding attack on your weapon. It's effectively a generator. And actually, some of the boss fights, I only spam that skill because the cast time on my active skills, my ones that cost mana, were so high that I would actually just output more DPS using my generator. And yeah, it, it had that feel. I'm just doing this little, tiny, little purple line at the enemy until it dies. Potions, bro. There's something wrong with the potions. Like for warriors, I was hearing the same thing. You got to go back and get HP pots. And uh, what was it? Uh, Gazi's sitting there left of me playing sorcerer, and he is like moaning every 10 seconds. I got to go back to town again and get mana pots. And then I'm saying the same thing about HP pots. It's like, bro, this is terrible. What I'm having to do is run from the little maggots during the worm fight to try to get the portal open so that I can go back to town to get potions instead of just killing the little guys and getting potions off of them. I'm literally kiting till I can get an opening to go back to town to interrupt the boss fight to get the potions to go back. The potions were like not correct. And maybe I was doing it wrong. Maybe I had to buy them, but it's like it seemed like a unanimous feedback I got from everyone. Where it's like there's something wrong with the except rangers because you could just generate potions, I guess, over time. But yeah. sorcerers and warriors were. We're not enjoying the potion ability for sure. Yeah, listen, we heard your feedback. We're going to disable town portal in boss fights. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> a good situation. No, but uh, to be real, yeah, I, I guess that, that is a huge problem. Either it's like the mana pots or it's the health pots. I guess they can solve that with like maybe a bit more like, you know, tuning on the, the cost of spells, at least for the mana side, and maybe like some more tools to solve mana early on. Maybe they can like put mana region very early in the skill tree or like the passive tree, or there could be like a clarity aura. I'm not sure if that even exists in PoE 2 right now. Okay. I know that was like heralds, but I guess you get them in Act 2 or something, but I'm not sure about clarity, for example. So there are tools like that, at least in PoE 1, where maybe you could have a more base region and yeah, it's just better tuning, I guess. It's mostly a tuning thing, I believe, that uh, they have to get right there. And I guess they're, they're very far away from, from getting that right. So. Yeah, I think like we we actually know I did find one. I had a mana flask that had a suffix that generated a flash charge every three seconds or something. Basically, the ranger node. And I think it's just it's just the problem that Rax was saying earlier, where Act One, it just feels like Act One is tuned in such a weird way because everyone that got to Act Two, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to Act Two because there was a bug progressing past the executioner. I had to kill him oh, no. five times. Yeah, yeah, I had to kill him five times. I called over one of the devs, and he was like, yeah, you just got to keep trying. <laughs> um, so I got stuck at the end of Act 1. I didn't get into Act 2. It took me and... three times. I had the same bug. Yeah, yeah where three the times, yeah. Door didn't open, yeah. I ran out of time after five. Uh, it, it, just, it feels like Act 1 is tuned in a way that is... May, maybe that's just their ruthless vision, and they're like, okay, Act 2, welcome to the fun time. And maybe that's just... I don't know if they want to do that. They... I think one of the biggest problems with POE one right now, just as Rack said, like the the row is in the mud flats. Like I, I think they're just they're laughing themselves to sleep every night. Like haha, look, everyone's getting stunned and die. Like they have an eighty percent death rate in the mud flats <laughs> until you learn to get good. I guess. But, Luras, Luras are like, like the you, most deadly creature in raid class. I guess it's crazy. You watch Ty, like Ty Ty Killer. Well, Reese says he's like he'll he's like the, one of the like top three speedrunners in the world, and he will die to Roas. And he's like, all right, go back to Runescape. I'm out. Like <laughs> that's crazy. When one of the best people in the entire world dies, so sick. and like you know the brutal world of Ray class is unforgiving. And it's oh, like the thing is, it turns off people so bad. I've had friends that literally uninstall after Brutus. Like they get to Brutus and they're like, "I just that was just not fun." That like, <laughs> it, and you know you can get good and maybe that's the experience they want. But I think there's so many people that would love the game if they could just get to the end game and engage with a little bit. I'm actually using Last Epoch right now. I got a few friends that are playing Last Epoch right now, and I'm using that as kind of a, a launching pad to get them into <laughs> PoE, PoE. Like, all right, you like the crafting, you like some complexity, you got loot filters? Well, come on down. We got that times a billion. <laughs> I like it. I like the the basic vision from grinding gear games, right? Like Diablo 2, I think a lot of people would consider the Di Diablo 2 the greatest ARPG ever. And one of the one of the reasons why Diablo 2 is so beautiful is it's difficult. It's very, very unforgiving. But the thing is, is it's, it's a fine thing to balance, right? You need to let people at least log into your game and play through, like, I don't know how many acts the campaign is going to be in, 
in Path of Exile too. But you gotta let him at least get through Act One without being met with a tremendous level of difficulty. They've got to be able to engage with some of your boss fights. They've got to be able to not know how to animation cancel, not know to port back to get extra potions in order to at least get rolling in the game. They don't need to make it face roll. There's no way you can lose. But uh, it sounds like currently it's very, very overtuned. And that, it, to me, it's it's a critical mistake that you can make because like, like Subtractum said, you can lose a lot of people very, very quickly. Like when it's like job interviewers that are reviewing your resume, like a common theory is that they look at it for like five seconds. You got five seconds to get something interesting on the page or they're going to move on. If the people play for 15 minutes and they've died three times and they're out of potions and they're out of mana and they're constantly swarmed and stunned, they can't kill anything. A lot of them will just uninstall the game and you, you never know, that could have been a lifelong player if they could just have gotten far enough to get the snowball rolling to have some fun. On the other hand, they do need to put some difficulty in the game because that's what makes a great ARPG. You gotta, again, developers have to give you problems that and give you interesting, fun ways to solve them. If you just win, they haven't created a problem for you to solve. It, it, it's tough to balance. I don't envy being a developer, but I do think this requires a lot of attention. You only get to you only get one chance to make a first impression. I think it was yep. in the preach interview, or it was in one of the interviews where they were talking about the difficulty of the games, and he asked about his philosophy on that. And what he said is he wants you to die twice to a boss, or and maybe, actually this might have been your interview. I forget whose it was. It was someone's interview I was watching that said he wants you to die twice to a boss and then on the third time get it. And when it comes to the difficulty of it, I felt like the frustrating difficulty was from the normal mobs, but I never mm -hmm. actually felt frustratingly difficult from the bosses. In fact, I felt an achievement after having be the boss, even if I did die multiple times to the boss, because I learned the mechanics of the boss. But when you're getting cheese from the wall, from a guy who's the same color as a wall then falls on top of you in the equivalent of maggot lair where you're walking in a linear path and you literally can't avoid it, that shit pissed me off and I didn't feel like it was a skill gap. It's just, okay, fine, you guys cheese me in the same like a Kaizo block Mario level. But the beating the boss for me felt like, okay, it's difficult, but I enjoy a difficulty at the boss portion. So I'm wondering if maybe they tune it a little bit, either give you more potions or make the individual portion of the monsters a little bit more manageable, but the bosses they keep at the difficulty. Because I really thought the bosses felt, I don't know how you feel about the bosses subtracting, but all of the ones I did felt like this is good. Like the, the, the balance of the bosses felt very fair to me. Love the boss. Yeah, I have no notes on the bosses. They are the, the highlight, by far the highlight. And that's actually what has me the most excited about the game is that executioner boss specifically the intro with him just like cutting someone's head off jumping down the sound like swells and you get this big boom when he lands on the ground his gigantic sunder how well telegraphed absolutely everything was and then like i died a couple times on him but then when i got it it was basically a no hit run and i just learned the mechanics it felt so satisfying to kill him a little disappointing on the loot that i got but like really <laughs> really satisfying to like learn that mechanic kill it like i love that and i want like that's perfect but then like the fact that you have to engage every single pack of white mobs <laughs> with the same care and it it feels less fair like the white mobs just felt like like you know actually still, harder than the boss trash. sometimes like <laughs> yeah. the trash mobs literally felt harder than the boss in some occasions yeah i had more deaths to trash mobs i think than bosses in in the 100%. whole playthrough which is wrong that should be that's that's wrong and half yeah. of them because i want to go back to town for the like 69th time this hour to get another potion so i'm just like all right i'm just going to try anyway and then i die and it resets the map and i have to do it all over again mm -hmm. yeah we heard you we're gonna make the well in town replenish twice an hour <laughs> yeah i don't like this woody joe guy i, I don't we, like yeah, get him off the balance team get him out <laughs> what here. is this guy doing we heard you and we put well refreshes mana pots and health pots in the shop <laughs> oh, oh. yeah, eight hundred value. Of, yeah. Some dragon's dogma shit. Damn. Well, eight hundred percent value there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess what they could do is just like, I guess you want to have like a bit of a break from like these intense boss fights, and like, when you go to the next zone, right? You finish the boss, it's like at the end of the zone. You go to the next one, and kind of like you know, maybe 
they could probably do a lot more of like density as well, where it's like, okay, you start small, there's like, you know, individual monsters, and you kind of like learn their mechanics the first time when you see them, and you know, then, then there's maybe like sometimes these pack of monsters where it's like 10 of them or so, and suddenly, you know, this is the moment where you have to be aware and not get surrounded and then do your slam in the right moment. But then you walk to the next guy and it's like a few like, you know, individual monsters and it's like not such a big deal. Then it comes like a rare pack, that comes a magic pack. And I think they need to like kind of just get the balance right between like how often you have these intense battles versus, you know, like constantly being in danger, right? Like, I feel like if you're like constantly sitting there and like, you know, super tense and like everything can insta-kill you and stun lock you, I think that's, yeah. I mean, personally, I would, I would like such a, you know, difficult game. I kind of like with Rax there, what he said earlier. But I also agree that it wouldn't probably make a good game for like you know most of the players that are trying to catch here. So yeah, I think they they have to do a lot of like fine tuning there, especially with like you know monster pack size, for example, or like you know the monster distribution in a zone or something like that. But one thing I wanted to ask you both of you like that have played. So how how many of the optional zones have you done, and how many of the optional bosses? Because as far as I know, you're kind of supposed to do, I believe, all of them because. I think these bosses always drop these like permanent power ups, and uh, like, like maybe some of them don't, or maybe some of them didn't do it in this playthrough. But I heard about this like a long time ago that there is like these hundred bosses throughout the campaign. Some of them optional, but we know we know how optional skill points are, for example, right? In, in PoE, for example. So um, how how did you progress actually? Did you just like rush to the objective, or did you also do a side side quest? Because that might also be a pretty important factor in like how hard it is. I skipped uh, side quests. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I I just did main. There was people that were doing side quests and they got experienced bosses as I did not get experience. My goal was I wanted to see how far in the axe I could get. So I was trying to rush. And so I was definitely pushing like faster than intended. I think there is rewards for like exploring, etc. But even with that, like I was saying earlier, by the time I got to act two, like it was it was really not a problem. And the amount of like rare and magic mobs that were showing up. I was refilling my pots much more commonly, so I wasn't really going back to town as much as I was experiencing Act 1. It's really kind of Act 1 where it felt a little clunky. Um, but yeah, no, I was skipping most of the, the side quests, although I heard there were some pretty good bosses I missed out on because of that. How about you, Sub? Yeah, uh, was the Devourer optional? Did you not do him? It was not optional. I had to do the oh, That one was not optional? Okay. Um, what about all the other graveyard bosses? Did you, were so those I skipped, optional? Those are the ones I skipped. Okay. I did Devourer, Executioner, uh, the Iron Manor, and then I did like the first Act Two boss. Okay, so you missed all the spectral bosses. Okay, I did. I um, saw one, but I didn't. I didn't engage with. Yeah. Them. So for me, unfortunately, because of Sork, uh, I I guess I did do all the optional bosses, and I didn't. <laughs> I got multiple P uh, gear items that had plus one level of all chaos spell skill gems. There is not a single chaos skill gem in the demo. So <laughs> that I uh, I got things. They looked cool. It potentially would have been really cool if I had chaos skills, but yeah, there weren't any any uh, power-ups for me there. And unfortunately, also the passive tree, which is very, very, very rough right now. Like if you looked at the outside yeah. of the passive tree, it would say like critical one, critical two. It was just demo demo yep. stats right now. Um, basically after the first four or five passive nodes, everything, I had to to go to anything else that had value for my character. It was like six six or seven travel nodes to get to something that had value. So I, I, I think I got a couple of additional levels, but it did nothing but, you know, little int nodes, unfortunately. Yeah, the fights I, are cool though. Yeah, I guess it's it, it really comes down to like you know maybe like we, we don't really know much about the game, right? Like everyone who played this is basically a noob, and it might also just be that people have not figured out how to actually play the game like at all, right? Like people were kind of like learning combos between like I saw for example Ben doing like this uh, tech with like these lightning arrows in the ground, and then they would like barrage lightning arrow through them, and they would like, you know, shock everything 10 times or something. And that was kind of like a like a burst combo he was doing. And I, I guess similar for another class, it's like, you know, as long as you don't even know, like, what is the combo that you have to do? And there might also be like a huge you know, difference in balance between how you play like in Act 1 versus Act 3 versus, you know, Act 6 versus in maps, with like, you know, how much you have to focus on these combos, right? So maybe it's it's, it's a completely viable that you just go like mostly auto attack in Act One, and this is how you play Act One, and then it kind of like you know you have like this this progression again right, that I talked about earlier, where you know you now you start feeling the combo being actually useful maybe in Act Two, and then you get leap slam, and then you like leap in and you do a combo and everything dies, and then in Act Three you get like the next thing, and then in Act Four you get another thing, and suddenly it all comes comes together. 
And maybe it's just also like a matter of not really understanding how the game in general works and something that you know people can figure out over time. I'm sure that if you have yeah. exactly the same game as now and let people play it for like a month, then <laughs> this footage will look very different from what we saw from like people playing it for four hours in Los Angeles. So this is mostly the point I'm trying to make here. Right. And uh, th that's completely true. People are going to get what, much more knowledge about the game, even if they don't change it. And they're going to do it much better. And the playthroughs are going to get easier. But to play a little bit of devil's advocate here, um, um, again, like not to just keep reiterating the same point, but the first playthrough is going to ma be make or break for a lot of people. A lot of people are not going to give it a, a month, a month of time for people to figure out the meta so they can learn Ben's tutorial on how to do a Ben combo with the, you know, the the lightning arrows and uh, all of these crazy things. The game needs to be viable without this experience. It needs to be viable without a YouTube video from Ben teaching us how to be a god. Um, but yes, the, the landscape of the game, even if they don't change it, we'll we'll get better at it and we'll figure it out. I kind of a, a kind of a hilarious parallel here. I was trying to figure out. So in Last Epoch, a lot of people keep asking me to make some kind of Rune Master guide. And I have an endgame Rune Master, and my Rune Master absolutely fries. But the whole path to getting up there was not that clear. It, it was kind of rough. And so I was like, well, I can't just make an endgame Rune Master guide and say, all right, everybody, well, get to, get, get to 80 and get all this gear, and then you're going to destroy the game. So then I was looking for different ways to level up with nothing, and trying to find a very clear-cut way to, to level up. And I know there's one really overpowered skill, Glacier. Glacier destroys, it obliterates everything, I know that. But people are like, oh, try Fireball, try Lightning Blast. No, 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 Rax, Fireball, but you have to take this unique. Well, what if I don't have the unique? Oh, well, then Fireball's not that good. Okay, it's like, so I have the knowledge to level up with Glacier to be able to play this Rune Master in the endgame, but if that's how it is all the time in PoE2 at the launch, oh, yeah, the people who have figured out the one way to run through the game and skip the side quests and not having a combo, I don't think that's going to work, man. Yeah, I agree with that. I guess it should be like, you know, like forgiving enough so that, for example, your auto attack in maybe in Act 1 is, is still powerful enough to kind of get you through, right? And you don't have to do those crazy combos and maybe you're going to figure them out later or something, right? And... um yeah, like kind of make it accessible, but maybe later on you kind of want to like include them more and more so that, you know, people kind of like have this learning curve. And yeah, I guess that was kind of like probably expected from the start from the developers that, you know, you do these combos as soon as you have them and this is how you play the game. But maybe it, sh it shouldn't be like that, right? So that's probably... Yeah. And one of the things they did is the very first thing they announced when we all got there was that they're delaying the game um, because <laughs> yeah. they say it's not exactly. ready. Yes. So I, I obviously they agree that it's not in the state they want it to be. And some of the logic that they used when they were delaying the game was because they added WASD. It changed kind of the balance of everything in particular. You know, now that you can move while attacking was something that they wanted to add. And that actually influences everything from how fast they need to make the mobs work and the balance of everything. And like Sub was saying earlier, uh, obviously the skill tree isn't finished. So I don't think it's necessarily in the state that they want it to be or else probably the beta wouldn't be pushed back so i am kind of curious to see on what changes they do implement after everyone has had some testing and some feedback on it um I, the part that i keep coming back to and like the reason i would want to play the game and i don't know if this is what they're designing the game for this is but for me it's like if i got through poe2 and all the acts and i get to the acts and i killed all the bosses I will have felt like I had a good time regardless almost of what the end game looks like because of the way that they made the bosses where each one of them feel like a unique individual fight. And because we have like, what, 100 plus of them, I think they said that if, if all of them are at the level of the ones that I was able to experience, it's going to be an enjoyable time if even the time in what PoE2 is, is just go through the campaign, kill these bosses defeat all 100 bosses, I'm still going to enjoy it for what that is. Maybe it's not the POE one in-game blasting everyone once. Maybe it's not the focus on making your character and the builds and all that that people are used to. But the actual part of like playing the game and fighting the bosses was really good. So I'm, I'm hoping that maybe the rest of the balance 
et cetera, you know, gets figured out. And I, to be honest, I have faith in that aspect because GGG seems to deliver out of almost any company we've seen so far. Um, but it, I really hope they actually don't touch the bosses too much because I thought it was about near perfect in, in my time playing it at least. I agree. Yeah. One thing, uh, not to go on like a tangent here, but one thing about about these games that I'm learning much more this year, and again, I, in no way am I trying to pick on Diablo 4, but I'm just going to use them as an example. I guess another example would have been Diablo Immortal. But one thing, and I'm interested to see if this impacts you guys as well, I I wouldn't say I'm a very emotional person. I, the person who knows here, me, uh, the most is probably Woody. I have normal mode and I have mad mode. That's pretty <laughs> much it. That's pretty much the only two. I like both. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. But um, I'm not really a very emotional person. I kind of just sit here and play games and that's it. But one thing that I learned this year that I didn't learn in any of the other years streaming is how much it impacts how much I'm enjoying a game as a streamer with how much my audience is enjoying it. So for the example here, one of the most draining things that happened to me is when a lot of people in Diablo 4, not to pick on Diablo 4, but this is this the example that I have, we're just upset by various things. The generators, the crowd control, the lack of endgame, you know, whatever the different things have been that they're trying to solve. At a certain point, when you log in day after day after day, it's like going to a, a job that you don't like and everyone, all your coworkers are complaining all the time. It, it really had a big impact on me personally. So what, what DM's saying, he's going through the POE game and he's feeling like the campaign is a, a big accomplishment and Woody's saying as we play it more, we're going to figure out the game. I'm 1,000% sure that's going to happen for all of us. We will solve the game. We will beat all the bosses. That's a guarantee. The thing that really matters to me is I would really love everyone to love Path of Exile 2. So uh, really a lot of my mentality is how do I get people to download the game, play it, get something that they like and stick with it and enjoy their time. So if the bosses are perfect and the trash mobs are bad and the potions are bad, anything like that, that it's going to, I really don't think of it. I guess another way to say this is I don't really think about it from my perspective. I don't sit there and play and say, how am I feeling about this? I try to imagine how will everybody feel about this and um i don't know i guess that's the end of my point but the how the audience feels about it has a much greater impact on me than i ever imagined previously yeah, yeah there's I, some i agree with that sorry there's some barriers to entry for sure in path of exile too and i agree that if they uh, smooth out the barriers to entry and keep it where people aren't turned off so early in the campaign that would probably be a good thing uh, in overall. I think another part that's probably gonna matter for PoE2 is how they market it as we get closer to the release. So a lot of times a game can be determined whether or not it's successful by if it's marketed to the correct audience. You know, D4 was marketed to literally everybody, so you see the response that we had. And Dark Souls is typically marketed as another Elden Ring, Dark Souls type of game. So if the expectations are clear before you go into the game, we're going to see less of the people that enter it just thinking like, oh, this is Cuphead or whatever. Like, it's just, you know, a game that's extremely difficult. If they market it to the correct people, then I think that probably will have a better impact in terms of how people feel about it going into it and how they describe the game. It seems like everything I've seen them say about their own game so far is difficulty. Like, I haven't seen them be like, this is a much more accessible version of PoE. I haven't really seen that. They say that they want it to be more widespread, but when they, when they talk about things like difficulty specifically, I, I never really see them push back, unless I'm missing something. I never see them pushing back about wanting the, the difficulty floor to be lower. It seems like they're, they're holding that line fairly high, and I'm hoping that they kind of remove some of the clunkiness out of the game, which is where I think the barriers to entry will will turn people off, is kind of the clunkiness of the game. Um, but I imagine they might keep the difficulty level like pretty high. At least that's the vibe I was getting. Maybe I have a bad take on this one, Sub. What do you think? Uh, I agree, yeah. I mean, I have the same instinct. And also, thank you for using floor properly. It's so annoying when people... <laughs> so many people use it incorrectly. Um, yeah, I have, uh, I have the very same instinct where they have that developer 
that that drive that old school d2 inspired drive to keep that difficulty floor a little bit higher and i, I don't think it's awful but it needs to have an intuitive feel that kind of smooths out through mastery and i i just didn't feel that in act one whatsoever i didn't feel in the the final zone in act one the the burning village that that compared to the zone at the beginning with all the werewolves it felt equally as annoying I, my character didn't feel <laughs> any more powerful at dealing with yeah. the the swarms of enemies or anything and i would have expected that my own personal skill or the character's power would have helped me overcome and make those trash mobs feel a little bit better like I'm kind of okay with the werewolves being a little annoying in that first zone, but the fact that the all the little fire dudes like, jumping out of the fire and just like okay, well, fire I got gotcha. you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the pigs, the, like yeah. The, yeah, these fire pigs just like running and exploding on you. Like it just didn't feel like I was getting better as a player or better. It's just like oh, just Agreed. memorize. Like it, yeah, yeah, it just didn't, agree. didn't feel smooth. To Rex's, yeah. to Rex's point, like I, I think that would actually piss people off. There's some stuff they add that I kind of hope they tune that I think is like there to piss off the the people that's kind of unnecessary. Like the dude, the ones that I think about is in the maggot layer, basically the dudes that come out of the walls. Yeah, like you yeah, can't yeah. see them. They're not. There's no warrant. Like they they're colored the exact same as the wall. So you're walking by and suddenly you just get stunned out of the wall. Like it felt frustrating. I was just like, come on, like why? You know what I mean? And so I some of those could be a turn off for some people for sure. They didn't really feel like a skill issue as much as just annoying. Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of like rough edges to smooth out still. And if they get it right and people have like a, a good time playing for Act 1 and then, you know, you start feeling the progression in Act 2 and Act 3 and you get stronger and get your links. And I guess it will kind of like naturally like smooth out, I guess, over time. And then you have to like find ways to still keep stuff challenging. Like if you like leap something into a pack and the pack just blows up. Yeah, that's fun. But on the other hand, do you still have a game at that point? Yeah, like, I mean, you know, like, they have to kind of like get that right as well, right? It can't just be only that as well. So I guess we'll see how it will actually balance out in the end. But yeah, there's <laughs> definitely a lot of work to be done. Um, I wanted to move on to the next topic, though. Um, and also I want to ask you guys real quick. Uh, so we had like almost 90 minutes in. I originally scheduled this for like around two hours. Are you fine with going a bit longer? Um, I'm not sure like if you have sure. any plans. Okay. I got all the time in the world. I just got to tell uh, tell Alex at Maxwell that the the build guide might get delayed a little bit, and it's Woody's fault. <laughs> okay. So as fine. long as you're willing to schedule Subtractum's funeral, then <laughs> we're, we're fine. Okay. Now I, I'll I have a call with Alex later anyway, so maybe I can save him. That's fine. Yeah, just okay. tell him it's your fault. All right, that's fine. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, I wanted to talk about um, D4 a little bit as well. So um, we have D4 and Last Epoch as well that I don't have here as my topics. So let's talk about D4 a bit, um, especially also like, I guess, in comparison to, um, you know, the recent news with uh, PoE, we had like, you know, two big announcements, basically, we had the D D4 season four stuff, and then we had the PoE two stuff and the PoE one Necropolis League, and it was like a lot of news basically at once. And everyone here also has played um, a good bunch of D4. Uh, okay, I'm not sure about Subtractum, but I think you said earlier you also have. Mm -hmm. um so i'm not sure about your experience exactly but yeah personally i've blasted a lot i know rex has i know dm has also and uh well let's talk about season four i guess and what it means for the game so what are your expectations what are your hopes and uh, do you think this is for example going to be enough for now to kind of like you know maybe stop this like default bad and you know attitude that we see all the time and you know how how you're going to feel this is going to impact the the game and uh, the community yeah, I think I think there's there's one word that Blizzard needs to target uh, in season four and the next few months, and if they can target a single word, I think they'll be totally fine. And that word is fun. It's all about fun. So people don't it. You can analyze as much as you want super end game theory crafting about how deep the crafting system is. Da 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 da. The question is, is people don't have fun picking up 900 yellows, sifting through them, and they're barely an upgrade And the way that you acquire them. They're not having too much fun with the builds because Last Epoch is making uniques where your detonating arrows now do way more damage and they're a melee skill and the traps throw them and then the traps blow up the whole world. And a lot of the uniques in Diablo 4 are like, Fireball does 10% more damage. It's just not fun. And 
a big, gigantic question, probably the biggest looming question that won't be solved until people actually log into the PTR is, is the pit fun? Do we have fun playing through the different GRs? For me, the in-depth technical analysis of how the progression systems should go, everyone can log into the, the PTR and give 10 pages of feedback. If people have fun with the new changes that Diablo 4 made and if they continue to increase that, I think they're going to win. So that's going to be my main question is, how am I feeling playing the game and what are people saying about playing the game? Are they entertained? That's the main question for me. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, some of the comments that I get when people are talking about why they don't like, for instance, Diablo 4, is that it feels like a chore to play. People say, I don't want to level the 100, even though it's one of the fastest ones to level of all time. And it just feels like a job, like running a million vaults, et cetera, running a million AOCs. You know, it, it feels like a chore. So I think you're right on the money there with fun. For me, okay, so what is actually going to implement fun? Well, I think itemization changes are more or less the only like major thing. We have the pit, but it's kind of greater rifts, right? And we have the same bosses, but now level 200. So realistically, we're talking about itemization here for season four. And if item chase is enjoyable, and if the process of getting an item, leveling the item, and master working the item gives you the basically the dopamine of did I get a big dick item or not, if that process there hits the mark, then the game will be fun for as long as it needs to be. I actually don't think Diablo 4's target market is to be a game that you put 500 hours into a season is. I think all they have to do is to make most people enjoy the game for 20 hours, a handful of hours. If again, most people do enjoy the game to around level 80, 85, maybe kill an in-game boss, maybe not. That's all they really got to do. It's the most casual out of all the ARPGs. And I think if they can hit that market, then they're going to get people to feel better about it in the current way the game sits until we get like ultra in-game, et cetera. So the itemization needs to be not a frustrating chore-like experience. I don't want when I log in to feel like leveling and masterworking my items, I don't want to do. It needs to feel easy enough and fun enough of actually creating the items for me that want to continue the process to chase the items. And then we're going to have to deal with like in game later. But I yeah, pretty much agree with the point there. Yeah, maybe some doctor has some points as well. Oh, I'll, I'll have the most good. unique perspective here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you get you guys are actually my D4 Sherpas. Um, the so I played in the preseason a lot and I. I had fun. Like I saw a lot of potential for the game in the preseason. Like I killed Uber Lilith. I felt I felt a sense of pride and accomplishment. I think I got a tier 100 Nightmare Dungeon, and I leveled yeah you know, level to 100 when it was hard. Um, oh god, that was actually not a fun grind. But yeah, like I I felt like okay, there's a really good foundation for this game. And then I saw you know everyone saw what season one was gonna be, and I've basically been using. I haven't played since the preseason. I've been using you guys as my guide to tell me whether I should play again. And I have not played since the preseason. Uh, you know, I've been, I've actually been following oh. you guys and just seeing like, when is something that is added to the game that really wants me to, to lock you? I'm sorry, sorry to blame you guys for me not playing, but uh, yeah, like I, I follow all your guys stuff and, and I just really waiting for that one thing where, you know, Rax or DM or Woody is just like, this is the one they, they solved it. They cracked the code and they unlock the fun of the potential of Diablo 4. Like, I still see there's still a nugget of potential in that game for me. And for, for me, like, the soul of what I liked about D4, it is the best multiplayer ARPG. Like, Last Epoch, you can play with people. PoE, there's, like, group play. But D4, I actually had so much fun going to helltides.com, putting that up on my side monitor, the boys would log in and we would just be like riding around hell tides and just like, oh, it's over here. The special chest is over here. And we're just going to like, we're doing stuff together. And it was fun. And like even cheesing some of the nightmare dungeons, like, oh, dude, we're going to cheese the XP in this one nightmare dungeon. I found that really fun. And then playing with my friends and even, yeah, even the world bosses and stuff. Uh, that's what I wanted is a world where there's fun stuff to do with my friends. I think that's actually their unique uh, competitive advantage would be leaning into that and because that social connection is something that uh yeah all the arpgs uh the other ones almost actively discourage and i just haven't like the stuff that they're adding 
doesn't feel like they're really leaning into that at all to like really encourage people to play together. And so, yeah, until like one of you guys says, hey, this is this is the mechanic that makes the game awesome and fun and I want and you should log in or get all your friends to log in. It's awesome to group up. They, they just unlocked eight person parties in like Uber nightmare dungeons. Let's go. Um, you know, until that happens, I don't know when I'm going to reinstall the game. So I'm waiting, though. I, I do want to play the game again at some point. Yeah, it's actually interesting to hear what, what he uh, described uh, about the group play, I gotta say. Um, I mean, first of all, in, in case you're not aware, like Season 4 is actually like a pretty huge break from the existing game. And we're gonna see on the PTR how it will actually play out. But, you know, with Loot 2.0, there is, and there's actually, you know, new endgame systems now, the pinnacle bosses that I hope are gonna feel like on a similar level as like the existing like Uber bosses in PoE. Um, if if they hit the mark right there on a the balancing, that can be really fun as a kind of like a, a benchmark and like a, a goal to have for a character, I think. But yeah, the group play is a really interesting point because I actually hear from a lot of people that Diablo 4 is like such an anti-social game as well because there's no group finder and, you know, you, you don't really have a good way to interact with people. But yeah, you need to have, like, if you have your f group of friends and you play together and you log in together and you do a hell tides, yeah, that's kind of nice. But for, like, the more casual play where it's like, okay, you log in and you have no one, it's, like, exactly the opposite. At least that's what I hear all the time. And personally, I cannot really say that I have done much in groups with anyone. I've played a little bit of Ziz at some point, like, in, in Season 0 or something. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know, some other people... But realistically, uh, the only stuff I've done in groups is like just farm some of the bosses because it's just four times more efficient. And I really hate that part of the game, to be honest. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to hear you be so positive about the group play. But I do agree that compared to the other RPGs, like D4 makes it very easy to group up because there's no like, you know, crazy like support meta like in Diablo 3 or in PoE where you have like, you know, uh, you need to have a certain build to actually like, you know, be effective as a team or something. You just like go in with your build and you blast and everyone just brings their, their own setup and, and it kind of works, right? So there is actually potential there to like make group play a lot bigger, but I feel like it's really untapped. And that's kind of like the, the one thing that is like recurring problem with the Diablo 4, right? So much untapped potential that uh, it's kind of like just going to waste, I feel. And uh, we see that in so many aspects. And, well, slowly they're, like, trying to, uh, to bring more stuff to the game now, and let's see how, how it will work out, I guess. So I think, I think Blizzard maybe doesn't get enough credit for what they did for multiplayer. They actually implemented the way to play with other people that I think is actually potentially the strongest of any of them. So with their initial idea for it to be a giant overworld game, they needed to solve something of, I'm, I'm sure Woody and I at least have heard this a million times. A lot of people, when we were playing Diablo 3, were screaming, I'm a solo player in Diablo 3, and solo players in Diablo 3 just completely get screwed in every way imaginable. Like, group play is infinitely stronger than solo and it has been the entire time so all we heard over and over and over was how can i play the game solo and what blizzard did with diablo 4 is they made it so you don't have to have friends well not quite the durial thing is a huge problem but with the overworld <laughs> you don't have to have friends because average none of us have any player, friends. yeah yeah none <laughs> of us have any friends and you don't have to party up you just ride to the world boss you just ride to the event you can as subtractum said get a group of people and blast nightmare dungeons and helltide and that's so fun or you can just go do helltide and there will just be people there and i actually think that they solved a very significant problem by doing that the singular thing that i think a lot of people are complaining about with um Diablo multiplayer is the lack of a group finder is the ability to find specific friends to play with. That makes sense. If you want to find new friends to do Helltide with, find new friends to do the dungeon finder, nothing that they have done has solved that specific issue, which is a problem, and they could implement that, and that could be untapped potential, as Woody has talked about. But I actually think they solved one of the biggest problems of I am so glad that I don't have to make a party to go to the world boss. Honestly, I don't need the party anyway. I'll just one shot it myself. But let's say that they actually make the world bosses hard one day. Do you really want to have to make a party to go kill the multiplayer world boss? Or do you just want to ride up and fight it and whoever's there is whoever's there? 
I, I think they deserve some credit for that, personally. I didn't mean to discredit them. I, and I do really agree that these are really strong points of Diablo 4, like this kind of like random encounters that you have with people that works really well. And then you have like, you know, this kind of like, you, know, you bring a group of friends that also works really well. But yeah, this one other part is really missing, right? Where it's like, you cannot find people. Like, you can't go and, and like, you know, make friends, basically, right? It's like, okay, you find random people in Hell Tides, but are you really going to, like, invite into a party and then, you know, add into a friend list and then group up again the next time? Yeah, that's not happening, right? So this is kind of like the, the piece that's missing. I feel like, you know, like, you know, like uh, communities from Diablo 3, for example, is, is like one of those things where it's like, okay, you want to do bounties? Sure, join the bounty community and, you know, LFG there, right? And you're going to find people to do a certain thing. And that is just, like, not there. It's also not there for trade as well. You find a really good item, how do you go trade? You go to a third party site and you trade there. Same same issue there that they could solve. I'd be curious to see how they're going to address trade now that both legendaries and uniques are going to be tradable going into season four. Some optimization there. I feel like it's the uh this the average session time of someone who plays Diablo 4 in an individual day is probably lower than some of the other categories, like maybe the ARPG. POE players on each day have more hours per day. So I feel like Diablo 4 would benefit greatly from a system that automates the ability, like you guys are saying, to find people. Because just from a streamlined process, like let's say the D4 average person plays like two hours a day, right? If you spend 30 minutes of that two hours to find somebody to play with, to get in a call or do all that, like you're, you're limited on how much time you really have left. Uh, with your session that day. So uh, the systems around it could be kind of nice. I do kind of agree with Rax's point about like, I, I do like the the fact that I don't feel like I have to go necessarily into a party. Uh, I liked Lost Ark and I liked raids in it, but the having to find a party that one, wants you, two, isn't toxic, three, is actually good enough to actually be able to do it. Like going through that part of it is frustrating. I feel like if you only have a limited amount of hours in any given day, uh, we saw this with WoW, right? I mean, how many times did you get on the raid and then someone's not there or something's messed up? And okay, well, we'll try again next week. So I'm kind of glad we were not gatekept by that. Super good analogy. Yes. Yeah. If mandatory multiplayer would lose the soul of an ARPG, I think. Yeah, that's exactly the problem that we had in Diablo 3, where it's like what Rex described. Multiplayer was kind of like the way to play Diablo 3. And that was fun of its own, and it was like, you know, it was like unique, I guess, to Diablo 3, the way that multiplayer worked, with like support builds, and you know, like just like the whole like meta in general, like how it was always, you know, like the speedruns, you had the, the pushing and all that. That was like really, truly unique for Diablo 3, but that was Diablo 3, and I think making a repeat of that would be a mistake as well. So I need to find like the, the right balance there, and so far they've done a really good job, but yeah. But I think this Agreed. is like all, yeah, like... You know, I, I wanted to get back a bit more to the to the topic of like in season four in, in, in particular with like uh the, the items. Like do you actually feel like this is kind of like enough to make items interesting outside of like the tuning and like, you know, how often you find them and all that stuff? Is that does it actually excite you with like, you know, the changes that are coming with the tempering and master working, for example? Do you think there could be more or do we like to see more or whatever? Well, I I view this topic maybe a little bit differently if Diablo 4's history had gone a different path. Uh, I think about it as, as a relative thing. It's all about trajectory for me. Uh, so what we current ha currently have just doesn't work for me at all. There is really no crafting, clicking upgrade five times at a blacksmith. It, we you've completely solved gems every build knows exactly what gem you're going to get at this point you're just going through the motions of walking to the thing upgrading it putting it in your items a lot of the stats are damage on tuesdays i'm so sick at looking at yellows a lot of the uniques don't really fundamentally change the build in an exciting way a lot of it doesn't really work for me now the changes that they're making one of the most exciting things that for me about the entire patch is sitting at seeing Adam Jackson sitting there on the couch saying, we're going to go with a much more bold strategy with uniques. Frozen orbs at the end spawn a conjuration that throw frozen orbs. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for them to take a bunch of risks 
I'm looking for them to trim the fat. I'm looking for them to give me a crafting system that actually matters. It's not just clicking upgrade five times. It's not just upgrading a gem that I already know by the time I'm level one what I'm going to get in the end game. It's I don't quite know what's going to drop. Picking it up is not going to be so bad. So there's not going to be so many items. It's going to be easy to read. And then let's see if I can get through this master working and not brick the item. Relatively, compared to what we have, the trajectory is so much better that I will be happy with that. I'm not looking for them to create the greatest crafting system ever. And I thought that the breadth of their announcement was bigger than I expected from them. So overall, I'm going into it fairly positively, even though Reddit just made a thread about me wanting and all of us wanting all games to fail. I don't know if you guys saw that one. I yeah, there's nothing I love more than a game being dead, so Twitch is dead, so that I make less ad revenue when I'm streaming to viewers. I mean, <laughs> but yeah, no. In terms of uh, in terms of the itemization changes, I have a very simple take. It's worth my time to log in to see if I like it. If I don't like it, I'm going to do exactly what I did in season three: not play it. But if I do like it, I'm going to play. I don't. I don't think it's much more complicated than that for me. If it feels good, I'm going to try it until it is boring, and then I will quit. And I'll do that every season with whatever mechanic they come out to. I'll try it until I get bored, and then I'll quit. That's it. Pretty much how it boils down to me. I don't, I'm not stressed about it anymore. I would say at the launch of the game, I was like, ah, shit. Like, I kind of, you know, I really hope they can recover quickly. I, I, don't, even, I don't really care anymore. It's like, I, I hope the game recovers because it is good for me. And I would love to have a third ARPG, PoE, Last Epoch, D4, Holy Trinity. Let me cycle between these. It's let's go, baby. It's literally perfect for all of us. So hopefully it's good. And I hope I enjoy it. And I hope when I log in, I have fun. If it's not, then I won't. I guess yeah. just, just to give one direct point to something that DM said, and maybe this is something that I need to work on personally as a human being, but I would say that I am stressed out about it. I am stressed out about how it's going to go. I am stressed out about Last Epoch, even though Last Epoch is doing well. I am stressed out about PoE2 and PoE1. And I don't know. I, I guess I don't have a good reason why, but I don't feel that way. I do feel stressed. It's not, it's not even a function of, oh, I need all of them to succeed. It, he's right. Like the Holy Trinity, I want to cycle through it. But I don't know. I... I am stressed out about it. I, I hope that it goes over well, to be honest. Like, what makes you stress exactly? Like, what do you feel? I mean, I think I think part of it goes back to, like, I've never really dealt with this in my career, but logging in every day in, like, July, August, September with the def so many people were so upset. That actually really started to get to me. And part of it is, like, like a personal, like, nostalgia thing. I've been playing Diablo since I was, like, 12. I grew up on this game. How how many how many years of our lives did we dedicate to Diablo 3? Not just in playing the game, but also in going to all of those round tables, trying to analyze things, trying to make the game better. I, I feel like there is a lot more at stake here for me than just if Diablo 4 sucks, I'm just gonna log out and I just don't care. It I, I, I do care. Like maybe I shouldn't. And like I said, that doesn't make me a better a better person. Maybe Maybe I should try to shrug it off, and maybe in some ways I, I've been trying to. But I I would be lying if I didn't say that I was stressed out about it. But maybe I'm the only one. I would be very, very sad if PoE, yeah. Like, the, the Lake of Calandra uh, was a notoriously poorly received league. And uh, yeah, that felt awful. It felt really, really bad. And if we didn't bounce back with Sentinel afterwards, I think it would have been... Um, yeah, it, it would have been a really lasting negative feeling for a lot of people. It it feels bad. Okay, I, I guess it's like, especially speaking from a content creator perspective, right? So it's like, okay, like you have like, you're like vibing, you have a good time, you build your channel and your audience and, you know, you wait for the next league and the next, next league is like a super letdown. And then everyone is kind of like, okay, I'm going to play other stuff now. Your numbers go down. It's like, you know, it goes all the opposite trend. I guess is mostly what you're referring to, right? So, yeah, I can kind of see that point from, from Rex. So, of course, like, if you know, like, the game fails and, and we're all going to suffer from it, right? Uh, both as someone who would like to play that game and also as someone who likes to, you know, try to make money off that game as well. So there's this yeah. side, of course. 
And yeah, yeah I mean, I think the the nostalgia point that Rax said uh, for me also, like I grew up with a lot of these games. Like it blows my mind that we're playing Diablo for like, t- was it 25 years ago, 28 years ago, I played Diablo one and now we have Diablo four. It's just crazy that it's, this franchise is still around for so long. And mm-hmm. like, you know, everything, uh, I've said some, some pretty negative things about Blizzard <laughs> in the past year, um, past couple years. I, I was a very, very big Warcraft three player. And what they did with Warcraft 3 Reforged, it it broke my like literally. I watched a video of uh, of Grubby, kind yeah, of like I, going, I going over it. As well and uh, it, I I teared up. <laughs> I straight up teared up as well. Like uh, seeing how much how heartbroken Grubby was with Warcraft 3 Reforged, and like my memories of that game as well and that whole that series. Like, man, it, it's it's just really unfortunate that these ips that we these worlds these characters that we grew up you know really caring about that really mean something to us now being owned by corporate entities that don't respect it and they don't respect the stories and the characters and the worlds and just the experiences that we've had growing up and it's just it really you know now being on the other side of being around for so long it just it feels so bad just seeing that it's turned into nothing more than a a monetary vehicle versus something that was clearly a work of passion and creativity, you know, 20 plus years ago, and it's just not being respected anymore. That's, that's how I feel. What, what subtractivists articulated much, a lot of that. I can understand that a lot because for instance, RuneScape's like my favorite game ever. And they're coming out with the original guy, Andrew Gower is coming out with a game called Brighter Shores, which is like his, he's making a new game, you know, that looks somewhat similar and I have high hopes for it. I hope it's going to be good because I'm a huge fan. So if that was disappointing, it'd be a bummer. It's like Metroid. If Metroid Dread was terrible, I'd be bummed out. That's one of my other favorite games of all time. That game was think, godly, by the way. Yeah, so I hear. I had. I actually got it. I still have to play. I've been saving it for a special occasion. Holy so I feel shit, like, man, you got to play it. <laughs> I know. I'm really looking forward to Super Metroid is like top three of my favorite games. No, Rax is saying play it right. Come on. No, play it right now. All right, go just got to go. Podcast is over. <laughs> dude, Metroid Dread. Dude, that game is godly, man. You got to play that game. That game's a 10. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're you're good. I, I really, I was just saying I can empathize because I feel like since I'm somewhat newer onto the ARPG scene, I don't have like as much nostalgia based around it or like i haven't been as into the scene forever and it was what six months ago seven months ago i was getting like five thousand views of video streaming to five people like it, for me it's the worst thing that happens i go right back to what i was just used to like in a memory time that i i'm familiar with. i feel like i i had like a lucky streak you know what i mean where we all we all got a really good opportunity with d4 i'm thankful for what we did get out of it to be quite honest with you i think that's part of the reason where it's kind of like i don't care because it's i mean it's we had a good run, you know what I mean? It's not like we didn't have a good run. We had a good run. I love One the game. One solid year. Yeah. <laughs> but we had a good run, boys. So, you know, I, I don't know. I I feel okay with it. Oh, look at the puppers. Yeah, I gotta say, as someone who has been, like, very obsessed with Diablo 4, like, you know, for, for basically two years at this point or, or something like that, you know, I've been gobbling up all the information. I've been preparing for that world first race, you know, like, basically a year in advance. And, and all that kind of stuff and now you know like all this yeah okay I, I kind of expected it to go well and have a good time and stuff but then you know like what Rax described of like people just being negative about the game all day long in your chat and I guess I have probably like kind of like still the most kind of like let's say um, you know positive like loyal Diablo 4 fan base I guess out of the four here and even in my chat I feel like there's so many people coming in and they're like yeah D4 bad and you know I hate this I hate that and yeah, it, it kind of it kind of feels bad, right? When you know, like I'm I'm just I'm just vibing, I'm having a good time, you know, making another character and uh, trying a new build, and I kind of enjoy the game for what it is now, waiting for the better times. You know, it's not like okay, I'm gonna play one character and log out and do something else, like for example, DM or something. Uh, but yeah, I, like I know that the game could be a lot better, and I'm kind of like waiting for that time for it to finally happen. And I guess you're slowly entering that phase now with. You know, season four. Apparently, season five is going to be like a big thing again. We have the expansion on the horizon as well, like end of the year, they said. So I really hope that it's going to be like some big turnaround again, where you know we all get to go back and and just blast the game again, and it's finally going to be in the state where uh, also just the developers want it, I guess. Like we talked about passion, for example, right? Where it's like 
uh, like the developers, like you know, there's like these, these corporate entities, like okay, we know like Blizzard is a mon monolith, and you know now it's owned by Microsoft, and you know there's obviously like a lot of like you know business uh, decisions involved and stuff like that. But I feel like by now we've, we're also kind of like slowly seeing like more of like the developers actually doing the thing that they wanted to do with the game, perhaps with like you know actually making a more interesting animation system, actually adding more stuff to the game to do. Which was kind of like probably just left out just to like rush out the game. I kind of feel like, you know, there was like, you know, more cooking needed basically, and they didn't have time to do it. And I feel like we're slowly getting to a point where we're actually soon seeing the fruits of their labor, so to say, where it's like, okay, now they actually managed to think about it again and, you know, rework the system. And it's, it's slowly moving in the direction where like the developers are actually like getting the vision for the game as well that they wanted. At least that's a bit my impression with D4, like, you know, with how it's moving right now. So I'm not sure how, how you feel about it. I mean, all that's true. I mean, I, I know you very well, Woody. I've worked with you on a million different things. You you are definitely able to take the bad punches uh, like like nothing happened. And <laughs> me and North War in the channel literally screaming at each other. So I'm, I, I'm not surprised. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a good attitude. It's a good, it's, it's in general, it's a good attitude to not dwell on the negativity and just to be happy with what you have and look, look toward the good times. That's, that's the way to be. Yeah. Um, but maybe yeah. I, I, I wanted to hear about subtractings, uh, subtractings, like, uh, maybe opinion as well. Like, I'm not sure, like, how much you are involved with, like, you know, the updates coming to season four and stuff. He said you mostly watch it through us or so, but I guess you are aware a little bit of what's coming. So maybe you have like a, a bit of a different perspective. Yeah, um, I mean, it's really interesting hearing what, what you just said, actually, where the devs, it feels like the devs are kind of getting their stride a little bit, and maybe it is a consequence of finally, finally getting rid of Bobby Kotick. Um, you know, he he did, he very specifically said, right, in his interviews that he would basically stranglehold anything that was like external IP, and, you know, he, he, he said go deep and not wide um, for basically just like zeroing down on, on profits and stuff. Uh, I don't know, you know, but uh, yeah, I think there were likely so many issues in the development process. Also, for reference, for if you guys don't know, I was a game dev for 20 years. So I, I have... I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, I was a game dev for 20 years. So I have a, I have a little oh. bit of a history in the industry. This um, guy's a god. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear I, about I, that after you're done with your point, if you don't mind. Curious. <laughs> I know a little bit about the process and how it can get interrupted. And the, the reason why I'm not a game dev right now is because I just... I don't like the politics and all the all the stuff that can come up um, like all those content creators that want your games to fail god damn why you just why do you hate my games <laughs> um poor rex but... that reddit thread really got to you bro <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah I, I think it's really interesting seeing like no one wants to work on something that sucks right and but but th there's also the issue of morale. I, I firmly believe that morale is a big thing, and I, I feel like just Diablo was developed through the worst turbulent uh, storms that Blizzard possibly had ever gone through. You know, particularly through COVID and getting exposed for all the all the controversies and everything a few years ago, and there was a big shakeup in the development and everything. And that's really hard. Like one of the biggest things about you know any software development, pro any process of anything, like, it doesn't matter if you're like. I don't know, making a sandcastle or something with a couple of people. The longer that you work with a team, the more you get to know each other. Those processes, getting better at it, is very instrumental to creating any product that's good. And if there's a gigantic shakeup, like I think people don't realize how big a gigantic shakeup, like I think they lost a very large percentage of their dev team, um, like in the mid COVID years. And that, like, I can only imagine if I lost like all of my senior programmers, my, you know, half of my, design game designers half my artists like that would shake up everything in such a destructive way that is arguably a miracle that diablo 4 even came out at all at this point and you know is i think the best that we can expect is that season after season they do improve um and it sounds like they are it's it's it, it's such a gigantic corporation it will be slow but you know as long as it doesn't get absolutely shelved as long as people are listening to feedback and improving and i think what rack said about that that one guy uh saying yeah i want something like a frost a frozen orb that shoots frozen orbs 
like that missing in Diablo four was like the number one thing I didn't like, like the, the uninspired uniques and the uninspired like build variety and all of that. That was my number one complaint. And if they are actually addressing that and starting to be creative, I think that's a good sign. And, um, you know, I, I think it is, it's funny to say D4 bad, but also it's at the end of the day, the best thing for the ARPG ecosystem and players in general is just more good games being supported and people loving them and good competition. Like we're already seeing this POE. Like I would not be surprised at all if much of the quality of life that we're getting in POE is because of last epochs quality of life. And D4, if they, you know, start pushing some cool innovations and stuff, and that will just make every other game better as well. Like, we should always be wanting games to be better and good for everybody. Yeah, well said. Agreed. Yeah, thanks for the insights, uh, Subtractum. Okay, um, does anyone have any other points about D4, or should we move on? Let me, uh, let me say one more thing about that final thing that Subtractum said. This is the one, I think, missing piece from Diablo 4 that I have not seen. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if Diablo 4 has got some big developers over there left with some big ideas, I would love to see them be bold and try some innovative stuff. I would like to see them try something new. A lot of people are kind of joking that Diablo 4 Season 4 is just a copy of Last Epoch. You know, they're exalted items or this or that in the crafting. I would love to see something new in, in these ARPGs, whether it's Diablo 4 or anything. I'm really hoping the expansion brings something that's truly new to the table. The pit is just greater ifs. The gauntlet is just challenge rifts. The crafting system, we saw almost an, an identical thing in Last Epoch. Again, it's it's a trajectory thing, so I'm fine with it. The trajectory is going positively, but besides just the uniques being crazy, frozen orbs, spawning conjurations that shoot frozen orbs, besides that, what other innovations do you have? You guys, I know Blizzard is not the same. It's not the Blizzard North that made the Diablo 2 that, like, jump-started the genre, but what do you have in the tank? Show me what you have. If Blizzard is very innovative with something, and even if they fail, I'll give them credit for it. For example, grinding gear games with a necropolis. You're going to kill enemies. You're going to cart them away in a wheelbarrow. It's in, They're in the morgue. You're going to drag their ass. You're going to bury them. You're going to dig them back up. Like At least you tried something. Even if it sucks, I give you credit for the idea no matter what. That's the thing that I'm missing, particularly from Diablo 4. It's kind of interesting, though, because you yeah. mentioned, like, these, you know, okay, like, there's a crazy league mechanics and stuff, but look at, like, the open world in D4. Look at, like, Hell Tides. And I think that they're, they're definitely, like, kind of like, interesting things that don't really exist in other games, at least not that I know in RPGs. So there is definitely, like, some stuff but I do agree that I would like them to be a lot more bold with like some of their, mm -hmm. you know, like new systems, especially in seasonal content, right? They can they can do crazy stuff. And if the seasonal mechanic doesn't really feel right, okay, then, you know, it, it's going to be gone after a few months. And I mean, PoE has done some really crazy stuff, right? You know, they've done Blight and they've done the Trial of the Ancestors and, you know, like putting like basically every single genre that exists into PoE uh, at some point. Uh, I guess you're only missing shooters, but we're getting that in PoE too. And, um, yeah, it's just, um, yeah, more of that stuff couldn't hurt D4 as well, right? And if, if people don't really accept it, then it can always phase out, or they can always, like, maybe keep a part of it and, you know, toss out the, the stuff that didn't work. Have they fixed stashes comment. yet? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that will be pseudo-fixed in, in Season 4, because the legendaries okay. go into your Codex of Power. The Codex of Power levels up now as you salvage them. Because okay. you used to fill up your whole stash with ledgers. But uh, Helltides were terror zones from Diablo 2. Mm. So we saw that before too, right? Uh, a, a zone gets corrupted and the enemies come and you get more experience and whatever. They were just terror zones from Diablo 2. Um, I, I, maybe I, I'm in... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Let me cut you off. Brother. No, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No. I was going to say, maybe I'm in the minority here. I don't actually mind if concepts are brought back or even ripped off from other games. Honestly, all I feel about is is make a game that's fun. I'm going to come back to the topic all the time. That's why your points is, well, is that make it for its fun where while I'm playing the game, I'm actually enjoying it. 
And if that means you have to take foraging potential, so be it. If you got to run back to D2 <laughs> and grab constant concepts from it, so be it. I just want to enjoy my time playing the game, and I don't want to have to be the one to fix it. I'm not getting paid as a dev to fix the game. I don't want to have to think about it. I just want to think about, do I like it when I log in? That's about it. So hell tides for me are kind of like, Meh. But for some reason, I like the blood tides. I think it kind of boils down to density, maybe. But <laughs> I didn't like the hell tides, but I did like the, the blood tides, I found myself realizing. Well, good news, uh, the hell tide is a blood tide now, so. <laughs> true, true, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it seems uh, like another, basically they cook everything. Another big miss, uh, like, uh, we, we can move off the Diablo 4 topic, but one thing that I, I just really don't understand, I don't understand it for Diablo 3's perspective or Diablo 4's perspective, you came up with one of the best systems ever in rune words. I thought, I thought runes and rune words in Diablo 2, they were overpowered for sure. They need a little bit of tuning there. But I thought that was one of the greatest systems. It, how good do you feel when you're running around in Chaos Sanctuary and you drop a jaw rune? I mean, oh my God, it's just, it's just the greatest thing. You know, you get your own rune and you can finally make your called arms. First of all, they announced rune runes and rune words for Diablo Four, but then they said we're going to call it the same thing, but they're completely different. They're like prefixes and suffixes, and they were gigantically nerfed. And then the whole crowd just said, "This is dog shit." And then they got rid of it. I cannot believe that they haven't taken an extremely strong look at rune words, innovated on it, and put it into Diablo Four. For the love of God, why didn't they do that? I have no idea. I think there's a good chance we're going to see them at some point, you know, especially with like unique, unique getting more, more crazy and then, you know, maybe them in, eventually doing like some more crafting stuff that they can do with uniques. Then I guess Rune Woods would be kind of the time to be introduced as well. So that might be an expansion thing. It was an expansion thing back in D2 as well, right? Like it didn't exist in Classic, I believe. And who knows? Maybe it's coming in the first expansion in a second or something. That would be kind of cool. Help us, please. Cool. Please help us. <laughs> Yeah, rumors are definitely much beloved, but it might also just be because they're really OP, I guess. Is that is that why people love them so much, or is it like actually a like a special feel about them? Yeah, I mean the thing is, the the reason why you play ARPGs is for the OPness. Everyone wants the OPness, right? And Everyone that's what we're that's what we're all about here. And mm -hmm. that power fantasy. Um and like I think that's one of the things that the best ones, like Diablo, Diablo 2 and and uh, yeah, last epoch now too and PoE, they're not afraid to lean into the OPness. And it's right uh here. like the the thing this has been my issue with uh Blizzard's balance for a long time is since when was the first time that they did this? It was back in World of Warcraft. I was vanilla wow back in the day. I was a mage, I had my talisman of ephemeral power and my Zandalarian hero charm. And I had my arcane power POM pyroblast, <laughs> and every three minutes I could say, you are dead. And granted, <laughs> yes, I understand that that was not the most fun thing in the world for everybody, but I actually, I mean, I, I'm very, very biased here, but the downs, you know, the downside of it is a very, very bad build outside of that one button every three minutes, right? I, I remember and... those uh, kill compilations of these uh, POM mages of like, you know, some rock pyro, music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it was, was so fun and like the, the vanilla, video yeah vanilla <laughs> wow had all that really stuff like you, you i'm i'm gonna be a priest and i'm just gonna go to a thousand needles i'm just gonna sleep you off the top of thousand needles and you're all just gonna fall off and die or a rogue i'm just gonna sit here uh i'm just gonna sit in the corner and you're gonna right before you get to the quest guy i'm just gonna i'm just gonna sap you and you're just gonna sit there and i'm gonna keep you permanently stunned and you can do these like crazy things that are unfun for the target but basically every class had a thing that was unfun for other people that you could do to them. And it was like, that's what I think for, if you're looking for a game that has that power fantasy, you want to be able to lean into that, uh, you know, that ability to just feel like, okay, for this one instance, I am overpowered and it's so awesome. You get the value for, you want to grind the opinus, right? right? And that's- Or you yeah, can just behold a barb. And then your O penis is massive, and you're just one shotting literally every single boss that ever existed in a one pump and done. <laughs> okay, guys. I had... but perfect phrasing, honestly. I, I've never heard better phrasing in my life. I just had 
beautiful flashbacks to the female Torin shamans named Oprah Winfury, where Winfury could proc Winfury. You run around mm -hmm. in your 40 to 49 BGs with your Kang the Decapitator, and boom, you hit somebody nine times for like 10 times their health. It's beautiful. Yeah, and then you lose Alterac Valley anyway because you're Horde, and it's, op <laughs> it's imbalanced anyway for the Alliance. God damn, those stupid True. paladins. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, before you drift too far off into uh, many different topics, uh, I guess we can move on to the last epoch here. So it's like the last, like, kind of like a big game topic that I want to discuss before we go, like, a bit of crossover. But, um, yeah, like, last epoch. So we, we already had, like, a few points. Like, we talked about the crafting and, you know, how the Diablo 4 has, like, you know, exalted items now and whatever. But, um, well, what was your experience of last epoch, first of all? You know, like, now that it has been out for a month, everyone has been blasting it, as far as I know. And um, most people had a really good time, but also like, where do you expect Last Epoch will land between the other games, for example? Like, what are your feelings about it for the future, and like, what are you planning to do? Yeah, so I think I think the context here is important. Like Subtractum was saying, you know, as a game dev, if you would have lost your entire team, that's a miracle that Diablo Four even launched. I think if you consider, you know, the size of the studio and all the things that they've been able to accomplish. I find Last Epoch is a massive success. Also, like Subtractum said, I think that their success only means good things for the consumer. I think that it raises the bar for a, a lot of a lot of the other gaming companies. Um, I think they're going to take inspiration from it, and maybe PoE is implementing quality of life because of it. Maybe Diablo 4 is implementing certain crafting things because of it. We won't know the cause and effect there. Maybe it's there, maybe it isn't. But either way, I think it's just a great game. Um, I think that what they have shared on their dev streams is accurate. The way that they make the game, the way that they continue to expand is in the end game. They have the Pinnacle Boss system coming out next next league. Um, it'll be very good, hopefully. And uh, they're fixing a lot of the bug fixes. One thing that I thought they did, which was a kind of a brilliant PR move, was they polled their community on how they're going to make their changes. I mean, now people feel almost empowered that, hey, I don't, I trust the last Epoch devs to listen and not sweep the rug out from under my feet whenever they're going to make major changes to the game. I think uh, they've done way more things right than wrong, and uh, it's looking very promising for me. I've had a great experience so far. I'm going to mirror very similar sentiments, which is that I think it's probably the best release of an ARPG in terms of like the core skeleton of a game that's ready on release that I've seen in a while. And it's kind of prepped for launch for when they start adding more things in. I like that immediately in 1.1, we're getting Pinnacle. And I'm going to double down and agree with Rax's point about interacting with the community. I think they probably have the best interactions with the community I've seen. They do a great job at uh, having a weekly stream, basically, that goes out there and constantly Q&A and answers things. And it kind of, it, it from what I've seen, it, it makes the community feel part of it instead of like an us against them mentality. It's like, let's make the game great together. And I think that's just, from a PR standpoint, a pretty smart way to do it. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. I think the, they probably have the best interaction. And what they did recently, where they actually changed their stance from like, okay, we don't nerf anything, even if it's bugged, unless it crashes the servers, to then polling the community, and the community clearly said, please fix that shit. Yeah, that was that was a really good move, I agree. And, you know, like, you expect builds to work a certain way, and then uh, for a certain thing just being 10 times stronger than intended, just breaks the entire game, and everyone is supposed to play that if they want to be strong, and right? And it's like a lot of other implications. And like, you know, raising the bar for a build and, you know, beyond what is actually the, the actual normal and these kind of things, right? So I think that was a really good move they did there. I guess there still remain like a lot of bugs and unfixed problems that they have to take care of at some point. And not just like there's one or two crazy builds, but there's more of these things like, like still hidden or, you know, kind of like waiting in the shadows until next patch elevates them again or something. Yeah, there's there's stuff like that. But overall, personally, I had a really good time playing Last Epoch, I gotta say. It um it really came as a surprise to me about how much I enjoyed it going through the game. Because I've seen the game kind of develop over the years. Like the first time I played it was maybe three years ago or so. I mean I made my first character. I made a rogue, of course. I played Blade Dancer. 
In fact, I actually just night last week went back to that character and finished it to level 100 <laughs> because I, I kept coming back to that build and it was so much fun. And um, yeah, like seeing the game kind of progress over time was was really cool. And then the, the big hype on the release and everyone was playing it, everyone's eyes were on Last Epoch. So it was a really cool experience. And uh, I really hope that they're going to kind of keep it up for the future with, you know, cool updates and stuff that you know, gets me excited to jump back in and gets a lot of other people excited to jump back in. But at least my personal impression is that while they are really close to the community and they do a lot of things right, I think they are somewhat slow at doing all that, which also has to do with the size of the studio. But I, I personally, I feel like, I, okay, it doesn't really do them justice, but practically the game didn't feel all too different like two years ago than it did now. And I feel like if you compare this to like PoE with like, you know, the large end game expansions, but even the individual leagues can do like a massive shake up. And if you compare this to like Diablo 4, like Diablo 4 nine months ago is a completely different game than what we're going to see in, in May, for example, uh, I feel. And I feel like in the last epoch, they, they are doing things really well and really like in tune with the community, but very slowly. So I'm not sure how, how your impression is with that. I'm so glad you said that because I didn't want to be the only guy that wasn't 100% glowing positive. <laughs> um, so I, I, I really liked the game. Uh, I played it a year and a half ago. So yeah, nearly two years ago. And I, I made a glowing video. I was like, wow, where, where did this game come from? This is so cool. Like their UI UX is beautiful. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, there's definitely a lot of flaws. Like I think the, the filter interface needs, the loot filter interface needs so much work. Um, I'm just so spoiled from filter blade, like just being able to reverse search, like why did this item show on my loot filter and be able to find the exact rules and fix it? I want that so bad in last epoch, but like, I love the UI UX, the crafting is beautiful, great foundational systems, really intuitive builds and everything feels really good. But I played it a year and a half ago and I was like, yo, this game's really cool. Really good foundation. They got like two or three dungeons that, you know, when that gets built up, that's great. Monoliths are really cool. That's going to be really great. I can't wait to see what content they add. And I didn't, I didn't touch the game in the past year and a half until release. I was like, all right, let's go. I can't wait to see what they added. And they added Falconer. And I was like, all right, that's cool. All right. And I guess the Exiled Mages, that's cool. Uh, unfortunately, all the experimented items were not usable for me. Uh, but besides that, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I'm, my concern is just the speed at which they can move. Like, I think beautiful foundation systems, really, really cool game. Um, I, I love the quality of life. Like, they clearly looked at PoE and were like, all right, how do we make this a game that's m actually more accessible? Like, what, how do we make an accessible PoE 1? And I think they did a great job of that. A lot of my friends that bounced off of PoE are playing Last Epoch right now. Mm -hmm. And they're so excited about it. Like, they, some of them have rerolled multiple characters and they're like, oh, I finally... I'm starting to understand the depth in PoE that you like and why this is working. And like, they're so excited, like, oh my God, I got, I got this idol that has uh, both necrotic res and some penetration. Like, they, that's perfect for my build. That's so cool. And they, like, they're starting to get it. And I think it's a great, <laughs> it, it's really, really cool how accessible the, uh, the systems and complexity still are in that game. But like, for me, the, the thing is, uh, the, the, the trouble is like, it doesn't have a, an identifying characteristic for me besides the fact that it's just a different game that draws me to it right now it, it needs something to like identify it as a unique game that is just this is our core competency this is what just makes the game awesome and i think they can find it like they they are very very smart their their base systems are so good but it hasn't found this thing like poe is just like we're insane like poe's <laughs> core competency is we are insane and we'll just do insane things um and Diablo 4 is like, we're super polished, we have an open world, and we, you know, and you can play multiplayer. That's, to me, is like the identifying characteristic. Last Epoch is, I don't have a single sentence that's like, this is why I want to play Last Epoch over other games, besides looking for a little bit of variety. So that, that, that to me, is like the thing that they need to work on. I believe that they can, and we'll see where it goes. But exactly like you said, Woody, is just like, in two years, 100%, there's probably so many engine improvements and like all that stuff that's like the hard part that's invisible when you're doing game dev um that's probably what they've been working on but yeah the, we have to just see now can they accelerate that engine and start adding content and, and make it you know make, make it find its soul that really identifies itself yeah i think i think one piece of context there that's interesting that's different between uh 
Woody and Subtractum and it's different from me and DM and DM can correct me if I'm wrong. I only played Last Epoch recently. So I haven't seen like that progression of, oh, I logged in two years ago. Oh, the game has barely changed. True. One thing that I am, I'm, I'm hoping changes about the game, um, if that's true, is, well, okay, they don't really add too many things for two years. They added two masteries and the exiled mages and the 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 factions is pretty cool their their take on trade and ssf true true but it uh it it makes me feel like they will be able to do that because well first of all the launch was a success and they you know made posts like all right now we're going full steam ahead but also one season after the first one comes out they're coming out with a pinnacle boss system not a pinnacle boss an entire system so that seems like two major changes in two different patches so not to just blindly defend Last Epoch here, but it's an interesting take because I didn't play it two years ago. So if you guys are saying it, both of you are saying it barely changed, I could definitely understand why that would be concerning. I can understand the point. I mean, for me, I think I, I moved on quicker than the average person. I hit level 85 like twice on two different characters. And after that, I was kind of like, okay, I can see what the end game is. It's pushing corruption and doing the endless arena until my hardcore character dies, et cetera. That seems fun. But I don't necessarily feel like I need to experience thousands of corruption for me to like get what I liked out of Last Epoch. And I'll check back in when it's, uh, you know, when it's got more polish out of it. I do feel positive about it mostly because I feel like the release is, for the most part, decently complete in terms of a basic release that is then going to be pushed out um you know going into the future so i can kind of get the points about like it hasn't progressed as much but i also looked back and i'm curious if you think the graphical progression is is enough to make you feel better about what they did with the time because i looked back at the basic and it looked like way graphically different uh than it does in its current iteration of release so i'm i'm assuming some of that progression time has been used on visuals and animations i think they redid all the rigging for all their character animations, et cetera, as well. So I think they kind of made a core game and then polished the core game for the entirety of that time would be my guess until they had a core polished core. And then they're going to add on to it from here on out. That'd be my guess. I don't know. Like, I know. Yeah, there, there definitely has been pretty uh, massive improvements in the graphics, especially with the 1.0 patch that actually added like the weather effects and like lighting shadows. There, there was definitely a, a jump there. And they also mentioned somewhere in like an interview or something that the graphics is something they always want to keep working on like forever basically and it's also like one of the things that uh, i hear from my community a lot like this is like one of the weakest points that last epoch currently has which is the graphics you know the game is basically fresh you know just came came out but it already looks dated right it's like it's like diablo 3 from like 12 years ago or something um uh, maybe on that level roughly or maybe not even so it's it already looks kind of like old and this is definitely something where they have to keep working on i think to kind of like you know please a certain part of the audience at least that really likes great graphics personally i don't really care too much about it you know it's nice if a game looks good but usually i just put everything on low graphics anyway so who cares but um yeah of course uh, they're, they're gonna lose a lot of people from not having like the same top-notch graphics like you know poe2 or d4 is gonna have is that something they should really like, you know, throw all the money on to solve? I don't think so, right? Because the people that play the game will enjoy it for other reasons. And I think that's mostly where they should take, take you know, like the, the biggest effort. And the graphics is kind of, yeah, it's nice if they do some updates, but it doesn't matter too much, I believe. I'm not sure if you have any other like, opinions on that, but... <laughs> I was just thinking, uh, the, just talk about the graphics point for a second is, um, I didn't play it. I didn't play it years ago. I only, you know, similar to the racks here. I started playing with a few months before it's launched at the most here. And, uh, the difference that they went from what the original ones I saw, when you see the sort of the progression video they put out of like where they started with the Kickstarter, et cetera, it looked pretty significantly different. I feel like Last Epoch's graphics are good enough for me to enjoy it. Like, I don't feel like when I'm playing it, that I'm looking at the graphics and thinking this is bad. I feel like it, oh yeah, it's an ARPG, feels pretty good. I was impressed though to say a positive thing about PoE2's graphics in comparison. I don't know, subtract them if you felt this way, but when I was playing Path of Exile 2, I felt like, like okay, Path of Exile 2 has the best graphics, then it would probably be D4, and then maybe like LE, and then and then PoE1. I feel like LE's graphics at least were more enjoyable than Path of Exile 1's in, in the current iteration is how I felt about it. 
yeah i mean poe2 is gorgeous that game is uh as really really and the the animations i part of my playthrough actually zoomed in and i just like spun my character around and walked a little bit the the cloth the cloths especially it looks so good um yeah the thing base poe is rough looking i will have to say that the the mtx if you put on like the <laughs> if you pay to win a little bit and look nice yeah it does it can be pretty nice looking um I think the thing for me with la with last epoch is uh, I make I've been making this comparison for many many years now is uh, back in the day uh, the Quake Three and Unreal Tournament came out at a very similar like within a year of each other and I loved both games I actually probably played more Unreal Tournament than Quake Three but there's this thing I describe in games that I just call like the crunchiness factor and in uh, Unreal Tournament if you hit someone with something it it felt like you were throwing styrofoam at them. Like the flat gun, which was supposed to be basically like a shotgun, just felt like you were throwing styrofoam blocks. The um, the shock rifle, you do this big, you could do a combo explosion with it. And it's just like, just like this little oh, uh, transparent purple poof. But you hit someone in the face with the rail gun in Quake 3, it even makes a sound, like a, the, a correct sound <laughs> effect. It feels so good. You rocket jump around, like the, everything from the sound effects to the look and the feel, it has this like crunch to it. I got and the memories from the LAN parties, man. Oh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and just like that, that feel. I that's something that I always look for in my games, and it's it's a hundred percent just a psychological trick because like the numbers can be exactly the same, but it's the way that the animations and the graphics and the the sound actually feel, and actually in, in Poe. So for Last Epoch, Last Epoch to me is like Unreal Tournament, kind of where everything's like a little floaty. It doesn't have that real crunch with like a sound effect that just. Mm, I feel like I, I hit someone with like a big nuke and they just exploded. But in PoE, there's actually there was a, a controversy where the shatter sound effect from Herald of Ice, it just it has this like it's a literal crunch sound effect of me shattering the entire screen of enemies. And there was one patch where they said, oh, there were performance issues with that shatter sound effect. So they put in a different one and the community lost their minds. Like it just it doesn't feel as good. All they did was change the sound effect. No functional difference whatsoever. And everyone was like, no way. We want our old like th there were like picket lines and polls and everything going out there um, just to bring back that crunchy factor. And I, I feel like that's something that you really get a little bit more in PoE than any of the other ARPGs for me, except for the one thing I will say, casting Deep Freeze and Diablo 4 might actually be the single most satisfying ability in any ARPG ever. Like if you just put on real good headphones, you zoom True. in, you got th that that boom, 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 and then everything freezes and shatters. I want that. I want that feel more in video games. I think it's so important. And like I find it very disappointing that so many games are not released with that level of detail to sound and grat. Like the feel of using using your abilities is like the most important thing, more than even just like the numbers and the tuning. And I want, I want more of that. And that's for me, that's one of the biggest weaknesses of last epoch is I had a I had a Falcon. I started Falconer and I just go, woo, I'm shooting my bird and everything's dying. I'm doing tons of damage, dive bomb. Woo, I'm flying around. But I never felt like, you know, particularly the way that they do the damage scaling on bosses. If you hit them really hard, it'll like, you know, scale down your damage. It, things felt very spongy and I never felt like that real, I'm hitting critical strikes. I'm crunching them or anything. And I'd, I'd really like for them to to look at that to uh, yeah to to really uh, get the game. Uh, I don't know. I want to feel the old penis. I want to feel it real deep inside me. I think that's pretty fair feedback, to be honest. I I know what you're saying because I was playing Hammer Paladin, and it did feel somewhat similar. Where I don't really feel the impact of each of the the hammers. Oh, penis! Oh my God, guys! <laughs> Yeah, okay, but I, I totally agree with like the, the point about the sound. Like the sound design is extremely important. And that can really make or break like the immersion level of the game and like you know the feel of it. And I totally agree. Like, you know, when, when you play like I know Rogue, like you know Rogue's my main class in E4 and I, I love Shadow in View and you know you you pop a pack, it explodes, it's kind of like this Herald of Ice Shatter feeling. You have like the insane, insane sound, and then the pack pops, and it just feels good, right? It's just like fun to use shadow imbue, and like you, you, a penetrating shot into the pack with shadow imbue, everything explodes, the entire screen, boom, and you have the sound. And yeah, I think this is definitely like a huge component missing from like making Last Epoch feel good. I I, I kind of agree with that. 
So yeah, the game is nice. I like the skill trees. I like the the, the, the you know diversity in the builds and the fury crafting. You can do lots of really cool stuff with all the uniques. Like every five minutes, there's another unique item dropping, and I'm like, man, I really need to make a character around this unique. And now I have like two thousand hours of build ideas stacked up that I will probably like never play half of them. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, like whenever I come back to the game, I have like you know hundred builds or something, and I'm like, yeah, like. That that is nice, but yeah, like, there's like these these little details that can make such a big difference. So I really hope that they they also like, are able to improve on that in the future as well. Yeah, I mean, I I think the details matter. They definitely matter, especially to like. I think it honestly matters even more to the casual audience because the couch dads that just buy a game and pop it on the PlayStation on their TV after work, they're not watching YouTube guys. They're not watching Twitch. They're just, they're literally just blasting in front of their TV. So how everything sounds and feels is really important. Um, so I definitely recognize the importance of this. I usually just turn on games. I don't really care too much how they look. I grew up with a regular Nintendo. Everything looks like shit over there. Half the time I have the the sound completely muted. I'm listening to music. So that's not going to ever make or break it for me personally. It's much more about like the gameplay, but I do think it's, it is critical. It, it is important for a lot of the people who play the game. Yes. Now, um, okay. Like what, one other topic that we kind of like, you know, drifted, like, uh, kind of like drift on the side was like, also like the, the progression of the the patches that we talked okay like dm and rax were not really playing it much before but um yeah we know that you know that they have some big plans for the upcoming patches and they are released in like in the next cycle we're gonna get like this pinnacle ball system and then probably something else but what would you actually like to see as well in addition to that for last epoch that would make it like maybe stand out like what would be an idea or like something that you know you think would just make the game better Yeah, I, I mean, go ahead, Dan. From like a comic perspective, it. I mean, I I am a big fan of music that is very set in tone to what you're doing. So one of my favorite things about Poe One when you're fighting the Uber bosses is they all sort of have their theme music and they talk a lot of shit to you, and I love that. So I kind of wish that like Last Epoch's voice lines were a little bit more like shit talking you. And that the music was more remember, like, like it's more memorable. I don't know what the word I'm looking for here. It's like, I don't really remember the music of Last Epoch that much, to be honest. And I don't re really remember the voice lines of them shit talking me as much as like irrelevant from The Shaper or something. Like I remember those, but I don't necessarily have ones that come to mind instantly when I think of last epoch's bosses so i liked the design of the bosses i just didn't really feel like they had as much personality because i didn't have the music and the shit talking i mean personally I, I that's just the thing that i like for myself i'd love to have more of those yeah the the key for me in an arpg right all of us play all these different kinds of games but if we're talking about an arpg specifically here an ARPG for me is all about replayability. It's all about that progression of the carrot on a stick, you know, the OPness diff deep inside me as subtract and describes it. Um, how are you going to keep me entertained in your end game systems? It really always comes down to that for me for every single game. I don't, no matter how beautiful you make the campaign, I'm going to rip through it instantly. And then I'm going to be in the end game. If you can make that very rewarding for me, you're always going to win. And I think in all of their end game systems, they could all be improved. For example, one thing that I heard the last Epoch devs say themselves with a problem with the dungeons, for example. Well, the first couple of times you do the lightless arbor, you light the trees on fire, you shift through the different uh, the things of time or whatever. It's really cool. It's really fun. It's a great idea. But when you're running your 40th temporal sanctum to slam your 10th pair of daggers where you just can't get what you want, even the last Epoch devs mentioned that the replayability of it is not very fun. There's no way to really be overpowered in the dungeons other than just having more boss damage. Nothing helps you get through these dungeons any faster and there aren't more dungeons and 
things like that, just as one example. The monolith system can be very greatly expanded other than just building corruption. They're fixing that with uh, the Pinnacle Boss system. And I'll tell you one one of their game modes that they have that I just don't enjoy is the arena. I just stand in the middle of an arena, the monsters run at me, and I kill them. And that's it. And I either die or I don't. Um, that to me is, and that's the thing with the leaderboard, but I haven't engaged with the leaderboards at all, and I'm normally a competitive player, but if I'm just going to stand in the middle of a gladiator arena and just th throw my minds to blow stuff up until I get one-shotted, that's not very engaging. So what do I want to see from Last Epoch going forward? What's going to keep me engaged? Keep working on the end game. Come out with new and innovative systems, as I, we asked for from D4, and continue to improve on the existing ones that we have to engage with, because the only one of them that has any replayability for me is Monoliths. Yeah, okay. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, exact same thing for me is... Uh... I don't know what the right term to be like horizontal. I guess you could call it horizontal content, but I mean, to make the POE comparison, I, you know, when POE had much less content, I found it much less engaging. Like I had bounced off the game initially and it was just after years of them adding lots and lots of potential things that you can do. And like, even within the mapping system itself, you, you have 10 years, you know, it's 10 years of content of, you know, Ford. If four times a year on average, three to four times a year, they would add something, and most of that went core. So it's like, am I going to find essences or strong boxes or legion or blight or breach? Like so many different things. And then not only that, I can engage in delve, I can engage in data. And it's for me, it's just like making the choice of what you can do that's like fun and engaging in the game that's unique. And I, every day I can choose to do something different. And like I'm, I am just not a, uh, a numbers go up only type of guy. I like that's why the it was encouraging when Rax said about D four the guy saying the frost the frost frozen orb that shoots frozen orbs something that changes the gameplay some like something that I aim for that's not just number go up but it's something that feels like a distinct unique feel and whether it's doing something in the end game or finding items that holy shit like I didn't even know that this was so creative that they tra drastically transformed the way that the skill works. And there's a good amount, there's more than of that in Last Epoch for release game than I would expect. Like, I think they did a decent job of that, but I would keep leaning into that and keep the horizontal growth of, like, variety of things to do because that's what's going to keep people, a wider variety of people engaged for longer as well. Because number go up is, is fine, but I think, at least for me, I got to, like, just a couple hundred corruption, and I was just like, eh, like, do I really want to just run this one till I get the perfect blessing? Not really. It's not that engaging. But if I could craft the monolith, like do something crazy or like in the monolith, I don't know, sacrifice a really good, like a three LP unique in this monolith, to like supercharge it. And it turns like the whole thing turns dark and red. And then it's summoning bosses or some crazy shit. Like, all right, <laughs> let's fucking go. Um, like, I, I think if they really lean into the system and build it out, in weird, wacky ways, then that's that's where a lot of their long term sustain is going to come from. Yeah, I also agree that I think especially Monolith system is probably like the main endgame system that they have, and this is where I can put a lot of stuff in there, right? Like the echoes themselves are kind of like just kind of like void of really anything to do. It's like you rush to the objective in like twenty seconds sometimes, and that's it, right? And there's there's not like a legion or a breach or an expedition or to kind of like keep you there. Uh, there's like nothing like that, right? So they can do stuff like that. And yeah, there's like some more meta progression system as well, right? Like, you know, an Atlas passive tree kind of thing or like, you know, Atlas progression. I mean, there's a bit of this with like the corruption pushing and the blessings, I guess, but not really. But yeah, they could like add, add some like overarching progression goals as well that you kind of complete as you do the other grind and then the other grind will feel like not so hollow i guess right like if you have to farm that same boss 20 times to get your blessing eventually then at least you also get something else on in the meantime and i feel that's kind of a bit missing right now it's like okay mm. you want to get that thing and it just doesn't drop and you can farm it over and over and over and yeah i also felt like at least playing circle of fortune i was just like not progressing anymore at some point like, I decided on my first character, I played a Falconer, and I was, like, mega blasting, rushing to 100, and so on, and I was like, okay, let's just go as far as possible with this character, and do everything, and, you know, do the tier 4 dungeons, and, 
you know, like try to push the, the rank one in the arena and, you know, get to a thousand corruption and all that. And I did that. And yeah, it was kind of like, okay, like 30, 40 hours in, I was kind of at the point where my character just like completely stopped progression. I was just in a, in a dead end and I didn't find a single upgrade for like 50 hours, even though I'm still like that far away from the actual potential of items I could get. And I felt like I just couldn't get any upgrades at all, even with like all the investment and the favor and, and the, the um, prophecies and everything, like nothing happened until like 50 hours later, like a bell dropped that gave me like 5% more HP or something. So um, yeah, it, it kind of feels like there's like also like something like missing where I want to keep grinding because if I think about doing that thing again with another character, I'm just going to stop by the time I hit 100, if not before that, because I feel like there's like too much of a step up in like, you know, the RNG needed and the progression and just kind of like, I've, I feel like I'm kind of stuck very early with my character. I just can't get uniques. I can't get, you know, free LP or two LP on that thing that I really want. And even if I get that, there's a high chance I'll, I'll miss the slam and I'm going to feel bad about it. And then I have to go back to like grinding that unique again for 10 hours or something like that. So it's like, yeah, it's like some middle step missing, I feel. And then it could be also like some more tail end progression, I think, long term as well. Yeah, a big thing for me is the um, I don't love infinitely scaling content. Uh, I've, one of the cool things about Path of Exile is it does have delve if you do want to infinitely scale, but there's something satisfying about, and this is one of my problems with Diablo 4 was the monster scaling with me. Um, one of the things I love is feeling more powerful and being to go back and like find that level one rat and just smack it and, and feel more powerful. And uh, like if you get that big gear upgrade, you want to feel stronger. Like it for me in PoE, I'm motivated to get that double corrupted plus one power charge helmet because I will notice I will notice that boss dying, uh, you know, a couple seconds faster. It is very significantly noticeable. And that that boss is a static thing that you're testing your build against. Whereas if you just keep pushing corruption, you keep pushing arena difficulty. You're always pushing your character against the, you know, as far as it can go. I'm yeah. And that was my problem with Greater Rifts in Diablo 3 is like I would push GRs and I was like, all right, well, I'm just sitting here spamming crowd control and I'm watching them slowly tick down. I want, you know, give me an Uber Diablo or something to test my build against and feel my power increase. And I, I think that's, I, I just don't love infinitely scaling content. I actually completely agree, dude. Like, one of the things I like about the fact that the bosses are just static and PoE, and I only use it as an example because it's, you know, the other ones are scaling, right? Is that when I make new characters, I can feel the difference in my learning progression. So it's like, okay, my first character struggled against the boss, second one got easier, third one, it was a joke. And then as you go through it, you can actually see the progression of how much better you're getting with each of your builds as well, was something I quite like. But we've been doing a lot of criticisms too of Ellie. I want to throw out something that I thought was, in my opinion, a, a W that almost like no one else does, which is offline mode. I, I, yes. I know it doesn't yes. matter to us as much. We are streamers. We're going to sit online all day, every day. But the ability to offline that and put it on Steam Deck is something that I see the community asking for in basically every ARPG. Like, let me just play the game single player. I don't want to play a multiplayer. I want to have it on, you know, offline mode, whatever. And they actually did it, which is awesome. And it works good. So uh, that was like a surprising W. I kind of hope that that becomes more of a standard norm. So that, you know, in some of these games, like Dragon's Dogma, for instance, the, the cloud save, you literally can't even make a new character. Like you have one that just <laughs> sinks you in and that's it. You make one character and you're stuck with your cloud save. So it's, it's I love you that buy another ability. One. <laughs> yes, I, I actually Apparently. agree with that. It's kind of like an overlooked point. And personally, I'm a big offline enjoyer in Last Epoch, actually. After the first character that I played for the World First race on Hardcore, I just completely played offline all the time. Like all my characters are offline. And uh, there's not really a, a point for me to like, you know, subject myself to like the risk of lagging out and losing my character in hardcore or something. And yeah, I mean, why not, right? If I don't want to trade with people, then this is the way. And that's really cool to have, I think, in last epoch. It's not such a big deal, I guess, in like 2024 anymore to have an offline mode, but it's really cool that they made it. So I, I kind of give them credit for that as well. I, I played offline all the time. Yeah, I actually played offline for the first couple of days because of uh, you know the server issues, and that was so welcome. Yeah, I That's guess it also I helped a lot say. with like the launch, like you know being much better received. Like there were like people complaining about the server issues, 
But ultimately, there was always offline, right? You could you could just make an offline character, and many people did. Sorry, Rex. No, I mean that, that I was going to say what Subtractum said. Uh, offline mode kind of saved the day for the first week. One thing that Last Epoch did, which I think surprised everybody, is their retention numbers were insane. They had mm -hmm. like whatever 200k in the first week, and then they had. 200k in the second week and everyone was screaming about how bad the servers were i just made an offline character um and uh well they didn't lose too many people even though they didn't have the best start so i think uh that's the, obviously not why they made offline mode they didn't make offline mode as a safety net for their launch but a lot of people love it so it, it's a w yeah for sure all right, um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to like shortcut the, the last few topics a little bit. So we also had planned to talk about, you know, like the, the overarching like uh, RPG landscape, I guess, with like D4, PoE and LE and now and what else is maybe on the horizon. Um, is there like any other games that you know, guys are looking forward to, like especially in RPG genre, but maybe something else as well that, you know, would interest you that would also kind of like fit into the discussion here? No rest for yeah. the wicked. Exactly what I was going to say. Oh, nice. Yeah. No rest no for the rest. wicked. I... Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go for it, man. Just add it. I was in. gonna say, I was gonna say machine gun, no rest for the wicked, Titan <laughs> Quest 2, Grim Gons getting an expansion, GTA 6. Uh, did, in dare 2028. I say this? Hold on, let me look <laughs> out my window. Me make sure that no one's gonna shoot me for this. Maybe <laughs> the Diablo 4 expansion? PoE well. 2? PoE 2? Maybe yes. the Diablo 4 expansion will be good. I just lost a thousand <laughs> followers for saying that. <laughs> you can you can watch it go down as we speak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's just plummeting. Yeah. yeah, no rest of the wicked definitely looks exciting. I didn't get to play it yet, but uh, I watched it with two people. That definitely looks like I guess it's also like even more extreme than PoE 2, right? With like the souls like feel and just like you know, really slow combat, very methodical, and like kind of like one to one fights even sometimes that actually last a long time, right? So this is what I got to, from from that game as a vibe, it's like you know, like really souls like but isometric. But uh, personally, that actually excites me as well. I'm kind of excited to, to like jump into that whenever I get the chance. Has anyone it's played it? A very it good here? time to be an ARPG fan. I haven't played it now. Yeah, I, I played it. It's it's tough. Um, it. So like I I walked up to the first zombie. I wasn't really I wasn't expecting the difficulty that was there, and the zombie just killed me easily. And I was like, oh, and then. I sat there and I spent like 10 minutes just dying to him over and over, but just trying to practice mechanics. There's like parry, dodge. It's like, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult. So like when you're going through like a Diablo map or a Last Epoch map or a PoE map, they have like, I don't know, 500 monsters on the screen. I think in the one hour playable demo from you starting and navigating through to fighting the boss, there were maybe like 20 total monsters. You're fighting like one or two monsters at a time, and you better be ready for it. Yeah, it didn't really feel much of an ARPG to me. Maybe itemization, sure. Uh, it definitely felt like Dark Souls with an isometric camera. That's what it felt like to me. Mm -hmm. It definitely did not feel like PoE, Last Epoch, Diablo. Nope. It, it, the difficulty was so high, and you're, just, you're essentially playing Street Fighter against a zombie. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, basically, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, for sure. It's going to be a good I practice for PoE too, I guess. It's like, okay, you have to dodge roll and you have to dodge the boss mechanics. So I guess, you know, once you master No Rest for the Wicked, then PoE 2 is going to be cake. So <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 it's even more than that, though. It's even more than, like, um, dodge rolling, see a telegraphed attack. It's, like, all about timing. Like, the zombie is punching right now. You need to parry right now, and you get two auto attacks in, and then he's going to do a follow-up. You have to, you almost have to, like, know what the zombie's moves are. It's like a boss fight, every single zombie. It's, uh, <laughs> the difficulty was higher than I expected it to be, and I already thought it was going to be pretty high. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, have you guys played, like, Grim Dawn? Like the nope. previous before the expansion, like I hear people are excited about Grim Dawn, but yeah, like personally, I don't know the game too well. I've seen like a little bit of it, I've not really played it more than like five minutes. But uh, I was just curious if anyone has experience of it. People tell me to play it, I have yet to play it. I was waiting for some big expansion or something to check it out. I looked at it, it looks all right, but 
I didn't see anything about it. Like, you know how uh, Subtractor was talking about Last Epoch, like it's hard to surmise, like what's the selling point of it? I, I don't hear one of those about Grimdom. Like, what is the reason to log in? I think it has a pretty interesting oh. class system where you can like, combine two classes or something. So just, if I remember correctly. So that's I, I like, think, a really cool thing. I think somebody who really likes Grimdon is Alkaiser. He's like big Grimdon guy. I've never played it. Um, a lot of people say the classes, and they said, I think Alkaiser said, it's either the end game or the progression system is the one that he likes the most. Um, but yeah, a lot of people say it's a great game. So I've heard some people call it Grim Yawn because they didn't really like it, but I hear much more people say that they enjoyed it. So I was going to do a playthrough of the original game before the expansion and then jump into the expansion and try it. But I don't know. The, the hype in the chats go, that I've been hearing is Seems like it's going to be a good one. I hear more good than bad. Same. Yeah, I'm quite, kind of excited. It's like coming sometime this year, right? And there's also Titan Quest too. So how about Titan Quest? Have you guys played that? Nah. Nope. <laughs> no, <laughs> thing, people. I played well, the Titan Quest 1 demo when I was a, a wee lad. <laughs> Long time yeah, ago. Yeah, and how did that go? What was your review? <laughs> From uh, I ago? liked it until my mom made me go to dinner. <laughs> God damn it! Yeah, Mom. it's like a really old game, right? Uh, like when did that come out? Grant, I was probably like 25 when that came out. Uh, when did? <laughs> Titan yeah, it's quest. kind of interesting to see that you know after so much time, suddenly there's gonna be like another release or something, right? It's kind of crazy. Yeah, so... I was 24. <laughs> oh man, decades. <laughs> okay, that's that's kind of cool. All right. So uh, speaking of game, yeah. oh sorry. Go on, Woody. I was just no, no. If you want to make a point, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna ask a quick question. We were talking in the topic of uh, you know other games that we we're excited for. I know Rex, you were excited by Final Fantasy because that was something that uh, you know it's a favorite of yours. So I was gonna wonder, did you like it? Like, how was the playthrough of it? What's your quick surmise of how you enjoyed Final Fantasy? So my initial plan was to play it until like I was gonna do like until I actually couldn't play anymore. I was going to do like a 48 hour stream, 100% the game. Mm -hmm. I ended up playing the game for about six or seven hours. And then I actually just shut it off and I stopped streaming it. Um, I think that the, a lot of the mechanics that they put in final fantasy seven, take away from the original, take away a lot of the magic of it. It felt like, again, how we talked about earlier about how Diablo four feels like a chore. You run around in the overworld and you do all these extra things that were never in the game and it just, the whole thing feels like a chore. One thing that I find very surprising about Final Fantasy's system, which is completely counter to like how Final Fantasies normally go, is again, you get new armor, you get new summons, you get new materia, and you feel stronger and you do better. I never changed my weapons. I never changed my armor. I never changed my materia. I never change my summons and I'm almost done with the entire game. I played it offline. I'm in chapter 10, which is almost through the, uh, most of the game. And you can literally beat the entire game with like the buster sword that your starter sword with nothing. And it. it's just so weird. Like, so even after you do all of these things to unlock all of these abilities, you don't have to equip any of them to beat the game. It's just a bunch of pointless systems that don't actually tie into anything i'm still enjoying it just because i love final fantasy and i love final fantasy 7 so much that it will just overcome all of these grievous problems but i i would be lying to you if i wasn't massively disappointed in the game i think it's summer uh, i don't know ubisoft it's, it's, was a mistake yeah it's just it's not the same man ff7 is in the conversation for greatest game ever Nobody's going to be talking about Final Fantasy Final Fantasy Seven Rebirth ever again. That's kind yeah. of disappointing to hear. Yeah, it's kind of sad. I mean, I'm not not really like in the Final Fantasy universe, but I know it's like a really big uh, franchise and it has a lot of fans. So yeah, if they actually make like a remaster, it's kind of like this reforged thing that we talked about earlier, right? It's like you know you're waiting and for for that thing to come out, and then it's actually worse than before, kind of. It's like, yeah, like, why did they even put in the effort? Like, what's the point, right? Like, it's it's money. Yeah, like, I mean, I have a whole thing about, like, media in general, revisiting it. Like, two of my favorite movies are, uh, like, RoboCop and Total Recall. And 
the dear God, you know, just looking at these old IPs, these companies that still own them, look at how they just get rehashed, you know, 20 years later over and over again for nostalgia bait and just like no respect for the source material. It's, we see it over and over again in, in all different mediums. And uh, I don't know, I just, I really believe in kind of like, maybe you can do like a director's cut thing, maybe, but sometimes that's even bad. Usually something was a masterpiece for a reason and you like can't improve it, right? Uh, it's just, it's there. It, you can cherish it for what it was, but just trying to revisit that and try to remake it and do something is generally just going to make it worse and, and take making, away from the uh... magic. You're making me think of the Halo TV show there, brother. Oh, oh, oh. Master Cheeks. I mean, I grew up with all the all the uh, straight to DVD or straight to VHS uh, remakes. Like we had we had Tomb Raider. We have Doom. Have you ever seen Doom with the Rock? Oh, man, it's got first person shooter perspective. I Holy actually cow, like that one, bro. You liked uh, Doom? Oh, I my God. Like, I know, I know. I know. That one was such a mindless. I'm like, fuck yeah, Doom. Let's go. Chainsaw. <laughs> I was I was hoping the whole movie was going to be in that first person mode where it's just, he's just gunning down. But, you know, uh, I took what yeah, I Yeah, I mean, granted, Doom's not like a, you know, a, a story driven yeah. masterpiece or anything. But <laughs> yeah, it's just like, it's one of those things where we're trying to adapt something. Yeah, or like, how about The Last Airbender, the movie by M. Night Sh Shyamalan, right? No, no, that doesn't exist. Yeah, no, yeah, no, we don't talk about that one. <laughs> don't talk about that like, one. Ta talk about abusing the source material, or how about Witcher uh, season two and three? I mean, we can we can just keep rattling them off, right? At, at a certain point, it's, uh, yeah, if you don't respect the source material, you're just going to get trash. Yeah, I mean, you're always going to have, like, this, this fan base that are going to disappoint so much, right? If you, like, go too far and, like, straight too far, basically. And yeah, if if the game is not what what people remember, what it used to be, like if they add new mechanics and those mechanics don't hit well, then yeah, that's that's it, right? So when I yeah, when I think about um like a redo, and people always say there's there's different names for it. There's remaster and there's reimagined and re everything. Okay, what whatever the fuck you want to call it, doesn't matter to me. The one that I think um set the bar pretty high, which had a lot at stake, but delivered beautifully was vicarious visions uh version of diablo 2 thought diablo 2 resurrected what mm. it felt like diablo 2 it was just a beautiful version of diablo 2 and they they went through they went back they flew to the old blizzard hq they opened up the old cabinet files they flipped through not just the art you know in the game but they read the files of okay what did the developers what are the little charms that they wanted to put dangling from this doorway here was the concept art here's how it actually looks in diablo 2 but you know the graphics there were so bad what if i could make this actual charm you know dangle from this doorway and they had all these different um videos going through the different areas of the town of here's what here was their vision here's what they came out with so we tried to make what they um were going for i thought the game is beautiful um i was very ready to hate it because i love diablo 2 so much but i i thought it was amazing and then the changes that they did make for example, like the weird like casting systems in Diablo 2 where you have to like press a skill and then it binds it to your mouse and then you have to right click it where they just made like the quick cast. Totally fine with that. I thought it made it that was a, an appropriate way to modernize the game um, while preserving kind of the magic of it. So, yeah, I wish that's, they would that's a really good example. Yeah. yeah, D2R is almost like a, a historical preservation. Where it's like yeah. <laughs> you can play the best version, you know, it's just it's just a, a polished version of D2. It's like the finding the continuing down the vision of the original developers and really respecting that material. Um, it's just so rare. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Like D2R from like all the remakes I've ever seen is probably the well the best the best made one, probably. So they did they did a good job there, especially after the Warcraft 3 debacle. Um, that was like not even much before that, right? It was like not even a year, I think. And uh, I think people were uh, very pessimistic about what would happen to D2, but it turned out really well. So that was like a, you know, like the worst thing ever and then the best thing ever, kind of. <laughs> Turns out the best thing Blizzard can do is outsource their work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Didn't they, didn't they envelop Vicarious Visions into Blizzard? I think they did. I think they did, but it sounds like they were uh, protected it enough. Yeah, 
But a good point there, Subtract, and it also brings us to the last topic, which is um, what can the developers learn from each other? So that was like a question I wanted to pose and just like, you know, have an open discussion about it, um, especially talking about PoE and Last Epoch and ND4, which were our big topics here today. So um, maybe it's like some things where, you know, like, okay, this thing GG does really well and this thing D4 does really well. And, you know, how would we like to see like maybe a bit more of like, okay, why don't they take this and, and that and just make the game a bit better in, in some, some sense, basically. So where would you guys see maybe some opportunities here? I think everybody right. should copy Diablo Immortal. Just a straight <laughs> copy everywhere. <laughs> and that's, that's the answer. If you want to make money. Uh, sure. I, uh, one that I actually have is the way that Last Epoch showed the percentages of the polls. I actually really like that they showed the data behind what the people actually voted on. So then when they made the decision, you knew whether or not the company was going with or against public opinion. I actually quite like that level of transparency. So I would love to see the data behind when they actually reach out and ask for feedback and then show that feedback to everyone so we can know what the public's going to say. Because it's one thing, if I go out there and I make a poll in my chat right now that says D4 bad, yes or no, I already know what it's going to be. Like everyone's going to say it. Everyone's independent polls and everyone's independent opinions, depending upon which creator you have, is going to be influenced by the community that they cultivate. We all know that. So I like it when the company comes out, gets the information, and then puts it out for everyone to see. I think that should be standard for sure. That's a good point. I think one of the biggest underlying things that make a game fun for me nowadays is customizing my experience. And so the way that some of these companies have been doing that is when I play Path of Exile and I reach the end game, I'm just running regular maps. I'm just trying to get some Atlas passive points. I'm just trying to get like any yellow item with movement speed and life on it so, so I can play the game. And then in the end, you're just juicing these things to the maximum, trying to hunt for the for the greatest items ever. And with the last season mechanic, when you get strong enough, you can inject that in there for even even more rewards. But the whole time, it was up to me how I played the game. So many choices in the Atlas Passive Tree of how I make my money. To me, that makes the game very fun. Last Epoch, they do that with the loot filter. They give me such a again maybe the ui is bad and the, some of the functionality of the loot filter needs to be completely different but that actually completely changes my experience than if you hadn't given me that functionality i need to be able to see the items that i care about and maybe at different stages of the game and when i can choose what actually drops down and makes me feel excited that makes the game a lot more fun for me in these arpgs when you make a linear path that i have to go down with nothing in the game for me to alter the way that I experience the game. To me, it's not an ARPG. It's like an RPG. It's like a role-playing game where I'm just going through the story that you have given me. So the more ways that you can give me to customize either literally the gameplay itself by editing the maps or by the way that I engage with things in the maps is going to be a win for me. So that, this probably poses another question then, especially to the point you just made. Like, when you compare, for example, the early game and, like, the progression of a character, let's say, to max level in, like, D4, where you have, like, this open world, it can it can go to domain tunnels, it can go to do whispers, uh, not, soon it can do hell tides, even from level 1, and then you have, like, you know, these different endgame systems that kind of, like, exist in, like, the higher world tiers. Like, how do you compare that to, like, you know, the force campaign playthrough and then kind of like you are in maps and it's like the one thing to do but you can customize the maps so how how is how's that i mean that that that's good that's a actually a beautiful question um for me personally i've never had a strong opinion on this while a lot of people from different communities do i think this is uh person to person some people just despise the idea of a forced campaign and they love that in Diablo 4 you can choose how you level up especially if they would actually balance it which they've done a better job of doing that before we used to reset strongholds which certainly was never the intention um i i would guess that most people would like the option to not have to do the campaign i think that's how most people would vote for me personally 
I don't, it doesn't really, it's never been a big point of contention for me one way or the other. One thing that I like about the campaign, about going through it that way, is you build some kind of mastery to it. You can learn every kind of trick in the book to accelerate your process. Maybe you make twink gear and you just you just detonate it. There is something beautiful about that. But there is also, a, again, another point to be made for leveling up however you want. It's hard for me to make a choice here. I don't know if you guys have other stronger, strong opinions about that, but I really never have. I'm pretty pro campaign, actually. Uh, I, I, Chris Wilson, uh, put it very like perfectly to me. With there's like no real reason. All people want is to have more fun leveling up their character, and their goal should be to just put more effort into like. If you have multiple options, people are just gonna go to the thing that they find more fun, and so. And, and then they get stuck with something that is just kind of vestigial and just kind of sitting there. Maybe your first character, you have to go through, through the campaign and then you hate that. And they're like, all right, I can't wait till I love my second character. I can skip the campaign. And then you just have this one alternate path that you're always going to do on any subsequent character where instead you can just focus on trying to, and I don't, this is not really a thing that anyone's really doing right now, but this is what Chris said that they should do is just try to make the campaign more fun. Find a way to make it a, an interesting and engaging thing to do multiple times. And I mean, for me, I find it I find it enjoyable. Like I, I actually really enjoy the the contrast of all right, I went through, I have this character, level 100 character, blasting, whatever. And now I'm starting from scratch. I get to go through that whole experience. Maybe I twink it, maybe I don't. And I get this level of mastery. I can time it. I can see, you know, I can do it deathless. I can uh, you know, get memorize memorize certain locations and pass and and get better at it. And eventually, right? It at the end of the day, like you can get it to a time. Like they, they would be incentivized to make the time very very similar anyway. So like if you could just do endless delve to level to to seventy versus doing the campaign, they would be incentivized as a developer regardless to still make it take five to ten hours. And I get I as someone who's done endless delve races a few times. I think most people would probably get sick of that. <laughs> you get sick of that too. And they're like, okay, well, you gave me the campaign in Endless Delve. Where's Endless Breach? All right, well, now I'm stuck at Endless Breach. How about Endless Blight? And it's it becomes this cascading issue where really you could invest resources into just streamlining, streamlining the campaign, making it fun, engaging. You know, just maybe juice up the loot a, a little bit as you do it. You get a little bit more of those fun uh, experiences of of upgrading your character. And that's actually something that they did this league, crazy enough. And the Necropolis uh, announcement, they said there will be hidden encounters in the campaign now, and they showed off you can get like double corrupt temples during the campaign, or you can get like accosted by a group of Brutuses in like Act Seven, and you know maybe they'll drop like guaranteed uniques or something. And I think adding things like that to make it kind of engaging and unique for just like one focus path is generally going to be a better use of resources as a company than trying to maintain like three different things that everyone's equally bored of at the end of the day. I think you put it really well, and I'm actually very excited to see the new campaign, like on on Friday when the league launches. And like, okay, like generally I'm kind of a campaign enjoyer. Like I don't really mind doing the campaign, and uh, I'm actually somewhat of a renowned enjoyer in Diablo Four as well, on popular opinion. But I actually kind of like doing that. It's kind of like a one-time thing per season, but yeah, that is gone now. And yeah, I, I do appreciate that I can just like start a character and do a bunch of different things. But I also like that you have this kind of like you know, like kind of streamlined progression. Okay, you go for the campaign and kind of like how you said it, like, you know, you you have some, this, this sense of familiarity and this kind of sense of progression and, you know, okay, now it's this boss, now it's this boss and every time it's going to feel a bit different depending on the build, depending on the drops that he had. And I kind of like that, to be honest. And if they actually spice it up with some cool little, you know, text here and there and there's like, you know, this encounter and you know, like suddenly there's like, they show like this omen and you get like solely there for five minutes, uh, you know, that that's going to be like this kind of like memorable, fun part of a campaign where you had this buff and then maybe there's later on you're going to get like some cool choice of a unique and you know, can use that to like speed it up. That'll be kind of fun. So I'm really excited to see what they did there and maybe they're going to do more like that in the future. And this could also be like kind of like a, model for poe2 i imagine yeah i think i think to play devil's advocate here i'm not saying that i agree with this but in having conversations about this over the years people will say things like well i go through the campaign and i get to the end game system all the beautiful systems that path of exile has and 
we as content creators, we we like to game probably a lot more hours than most people do, and we we also can because it's our job. But the thought for a lot of casual people of if I want to make an alt, I have to go through another ten plus hour campaign just so I can get to maps is just devastating to them. And another thing that is difficult for me to solve as a question about um, leveling up again through the campaign or multiple different things is at the end of the day, what I want to do is the progression system of a game usually has all the best stuff in the end game. So usually whenever I make a second character, my only thought without any, any concern for fun is how do I get to the end game as fast as possible just to get the really good stuff? So it seems like one way that Path of Exile is trying to solve that very, very difficult question to answer is by putting some very valuable things and some surprises in the campaign, which is exciting, and it will, it will bring back some people and that, that is working toward a solution. But that overarching problem of what is better than just rocketing to the end game on your second and third characters just to farm the juiciest content and everything else is just sitting in your way? I think that that you know, makes it very difficult for a campaign to be very, very enticing for people. Um, like one, it, like, it's not like Diablo 4 does leveling very well, but at least one option in Diablo 4 is when I'm out of gold, while I'm leveling up, I can go do a Tree of Whispers, and then I'm going to have gold for the end game. Um, just to play devil's advocate of some some arguments that some people may make. I think that's totally fair. Um, and I think that's what they're, I, I hope that they're trying to do with the the new stuff that they're adding in the campaign that might accelerate you getting to that end game and maybe be usable within the end game as well. Like. If you could get a double corrupted helmet that has power charge and life or something on the implicits, that could actually be just a nice valuable item in a moment of joy that can happen. I think that's the big thing is right now the campaign, there's no moments of joy. It's like very (laughs) streamlined and you're just, okay, I know I can do this in five hours. I've practiced it. I got my, you know, I got my POB on the other monitor. I am following the skill points perfectly and you know, I'm just going to do it. And then, okay. And then I have my plan for unlocking the Atlas and then I'm going to start to blast. And you, you just have this set five to 10 hour period where you know it is a chore. There is nothing fun, objectively like fun and unique or interesting that's going to happen. I'm just going to get through that chore. And yeah, if something could happen, like a cool double corruption or a, you know, a semi-guaranteed, like a, any unique could drop and you could be bad, could be good, a chance for something fun and interesting to happen. Um, that will, I think that could make a very big difference. Yeah. I mean, it kind of depends upon... Uh the execution and focus of a campaign like the more that these campaigns have fetch quests escort quests like annoying things to do the less i want to do them is what i find myself like i'm sitting here thinking about i'm hearing these arguments i'm thinking you know there's some really good points on both sides but then i ask myself do i want to do that camel quest again in diablo 4 do i want to follow the snake through the forest again and i find myself telling myself no i actually don't want to do that but whereas in, I'm thinking about POE 2, and we got to finish the campaign now and see what we think, but I'm thinking, okay, the bosses are enjoyable. So I could see myself enjoying replayability in the campaign. I think it depends upon the game's execution of the campaign itself and whether or not I find the campaign as enjoyable in a replayable fashion. Because to Rax's point, by the time I get onto alts and whatever given league or something like that, the willingness of me to run a campaign over and over again starts to diminish with the more characters I create. Uh, so as long as there isn't too many 100% like, you know, optional, but not really like escort quests and shit like that, I don't mind a campaign as much as long as it's killing some bosses, blasting through, and I don't feel horribly handicapped by doing it. Yeah, it's fair points for sure. And I, mm-hmm. I think like making it a replayable and like fun every time you do it is very important. And I think this is probably like one of those big things that really holds people back from enjoying it sometimes. Like even like the thought of like leveling one more character for the new league, like the first league starter already like puts people off so much, I feel sometimes. And I feel like, you know, doing like one or two campaign playthroughs in like, you know, three months or something is not a big deal, but I also understand I'm not like everyone. So 
But yeah, is there like any other points that we, we could talk about in terms of like, okay, like, you know, what does this game do really well that maybe the other game developers should maybe like take a bit of notes from, for example, like outside you of the know, stuff? So one thing that we usually don't do is we don't say like negative things about Path of Exile, right? Path of Exile is usually winning in most categories and it's... Oh, I'll hit probably... you with negatives. Oh yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah, well, I... I got one that even grinding gear games hates, and I, I think this is, I would call it a requirement. I call it a, re a requirement going forward for ARPGs. The success of your character cannot be dependent upon a bunch of third-party tools. Like, when I'm playing Tornado, Tornado Shot, I, I can't even tell you how many different programs and discords and this or that, like... Okay, if we need, if we have our build guide, okay. I even have to go out to adjust my loot filter. Um, this is probably one of the things that I find most demoralizing about Path of Exile. And if I find it demoralizing, I am much more willing to do it to get the optimal answer than the average gamer. The average gamer is not going to do jack shit about tabbing out to have all these resources open just so you can play the video game in front of you correctly. I think this is something, I think this is a requirement that must be abolished going forward in ARPG design, where, for example, last Epoch has the in-game guide in the game. Um, they put the trading thing in the game. They put the loot filter in the game. Um, that's something that I think I, I would love to see it just completely go away. Yeah, I don't think anyone loves yeah all the third party tools. It's uh, POB is um, so there a lot of them we can solve. So filter blade hundred uh, percent. That's just like crazy. That like to know what item the, like think think of what this does to know whether the item that dropped on the ground is worth picking up. You have to go to a third party tool, possibly spend hours. I spend hours every league customizing the colors and the sound effects and everything just to tell me whether I should stop and pick up this item. And if I, God forbid, I ever press alt because there will be so many items that dropped on the ground, the game will crash. The loot filter is literally mandatory to play the game. And anything that ships with the game, like that comes with a default loot filter, guarantees the game doesn't crash, but it does nothing more. Uh, that's crazy. Uh, and then the other, I think the other one that would be easily replaceable for them would be Awaken PoE Trade. That That's the one where like, Okay, you guys own the trade website. You you guys you have that. Like that that is hosted on your own website. That whole interface of hey, let me price check this item. Let me check off what things I want to price check against. And then hey, whisper these people. I mean, oh, that's already so esoteric. We we shouldn't get into trades like something else. Um, but that whole thing, like the fact that you have to have a second browser, a browser open, and then a third party tool just to tell you what to type into the browser to find the item that you dropped on the ground and to find the price of that, like. That's they they own the website. That is all stuff that they could integrate. And just getting rid of those two third party tools, hundred percent. I think that would go such a long way. Um, POB is a whole different beast, though, and that's that's kind of a consequence of the complexity of the game. And I actually don't like that. That's a that would be a a, a different discussion, I think. But yeah, we we could definitely simplify a lot. I'd be interested to see, to your point about price checking, et cetera, with trade, because of the way trade's going to work in PoE2, if they could actually implement something like that fairly easily, considering that we're getting, what, the auction house, et cetera? With oh, trade, so correct? it already exists. It already exists in the console version of PoE1. Like, they, all they have to do is put it in the PC version. Like, the crazy thing, look up the Chinese version of PoE1. It's, it, like, it's got a lot of pay-to-win stuff. It's got, like, some awful stuff. But the Chinese version has crazy things all sorts of crazy things and interfaces and everything and the console version has like actually a pretty clean trade interface already they they are 100 percent capable of doing this and implementing it without too much effort like not an insane amount of effort but they're just like well hey it works like apparently they have that we call it the trade guy um one one league uh we we asked for some feature i forget what it was i think it was searching for crucible trees yeah because your, your weapons yes. Yeah, yeah. And so Chris was like, well, uh, I don't know if that's going to be on league release yet. Let me ask. Let me see if the trade guy is going to have it ready. There's apparently just one guy that works on the <laughs> entire trade website, like the whole foundation of the economy. He's just Atlas 
holding this website on his back. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's uh yeah, twine and twine and sticks for sure. Yes. Yeah, for sure that there's like a lot of things they, they could learn there and uh, maybe improve. So yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with all the third party stuff. It's also kind of like made me go more and more like SSF in the in the past. Like I used to trade a lot more and I just kind of came to realize that I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to care about the economy. I don't want to go and whisper a thousand people for everything. And, you know, I kind of like just went and I didn't like directly play as if necessarily very much, but I kind of like just try to interact with it as little as possible. And that made me enjoy the game a lot more. Um, mostly due to the fact that it's just such a hassle. So, <laughs> yeah, I hope that is going to improve. And I guess same same story for Diablo 4, right? I have barely traded in Diablo 4. And I guess it's like much less necessary. But I guess in the following patches that might become more of a thing. But it's like such a hassle to like try to find an item and then try to invite someone. You have to add them and like, oh my god, man. Like, yeah, that's Epic definitely has like the by far the best implementation of that, I guess. Return of the real money auction house in Diablo 4 incoming. <laughs> I made some good money off that thing. That was a that was a great couple of weeks. <laughs> if you, Amazing, yeah. I mean, if you, if you just think about it in in the most basic fundamental sense, without diving it at all, imagine that in order to correctly play a video game, you need to tab out of that video game. Like, like uh, even even if you want to look at it from a bottom line perspective, from a purely financial perspective, getting people to tab out of your game cannot be good for you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, fair, fair point, I guess. Yeah. Okay, it's one of those things where, yeah, if you look just if you look historically, they've been very they don't want this stuff in the game. That's the other thing is I I don't. I, I anticipate now that Mark is the game director of PoE One instead of Chris that we may start to see some of these more change these bigger changes happening. Like we already see all this quality of life stuff happening in this league. Um, traditionally, they were like trade. The only way you could trade was go to Lionize Watch and and talk in global chat and be like, "Hey, I have a I have a forty percent res gold rim. Does anyone have ten chaos?" And that was the only way to trade. And then people were like, "This sucks." And GGG was like, "All right, well." We'll let you put item list them on the forums. And so like the only way to trade was like, all right, I'm gonna send the person a DM on the forums, and then maybe on the third blood moon next month he'll come back and uh, <laughs> we can log on at six PM and meet each other in Lion Eyes Watch. And it's just been the the ball's kind of been rolling from that, where you know the, what the vision is and what they want is like really close to like early Diablo two trading. You know, pre pre uh, Stones of Jordan, even, and people are like, "All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a thousand gold on the ground right here. You're gonna drop the plus one skill charm over there, and we're gonna walk. You're gonna do like a high noon, and we're gonna walk past each other, and we're gonna we're just gonna pick up our items on the other side, right? And that's like kind of sure, vision. And you make sure you're going outside because then you can teleport back inside and get both <laughs> items. Yeah, that, yep, that guy that with the anything. Enigma chest. Yep, that Enigma. Oh God damn, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, oh, but, but, but that raises a philosophical question though. So this is going to be deep. So let, let's think about this. If path of exile does not implement trade in the game, but people trade in path of exile via third party apps is trade in path of exile. It's like Schrodinger's trade. What <laughs> it is. Is it in the game? Or isn't it in the game? Well, if I can right-click on somebody and click trade, it's probably in the game. <laughs> that, that, that's that's exactly what I was going to say. If you don't want trade in the game, get rid of the trade button. Yeah. Why is there a trade button if you want to get rid of it? There is trade in the game, right? Because you can go on third party and trade. So, I mean, we've reached an inflection point here. Take away the trade button. Or help us, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm with you. I'm I'm pro quality of life for sure. That it's uh, the fact that, like awaken people. I still every league I get dozens of people being like, "What's that thing that you use in a price check?" And I'm like, "How the hell are you playing the game? You don't have awaken <laughs> PUE trade? What the hell? Yeah, it's, it's I don't, true, the game's like, like unplayable without it. 
Every yeah. time I price check something, I get exactly that. Like, it, it, like even me, like, you know, when I casually stream, like, some PoE here and there or something, that's like, hey, man, what is that? Like, I've been playing PoE for so long, I, I haven't seen this. And, like, whoa. <laughs> like, yeah. It's kind of crazy to think about. But, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I totally agree. I think that GG has earned a lot of, like, um, like you know, pluses, I guess, from this league and from the past few leagues where they just implemented some more, like, quality of life stuff. Like, all this, like, you know, shift, control, click, a stack of currency, and, you know, like these kind of things, I think they just make the game better with no downside whatsoever, right? Like, you know, this is how the game works, people do trade, and, you know, it just sucks that you have to click on, like, you know, your chaos, like, 200 times to fill up your inventory and then put it all in the trade window, and, yeah, just these little things, but they have such an impact, right? And it's kind of crazy to think that, the game has worked for a decade in a certain way, and now they're finally changing it. <laughs> like these, these little things that actually have such a huge impact. Like it's it's kind of wild. Well, also like these other changes they made over time. Like you know, for example, dropping like stacks of small currency instead of just individual like ten scrolls and ten transmutes everywhere. And like these little things, right? But they're so important, I feel, and they don't take anything away from the game. They can only make it better. So yeah, kind of crazy how. How long it took for some of them, and I guess how many more opportunities there are still in in PoE, right, <laughs> to to implement stuff like that. It's really interesting, yeah. Old school sensibilities kind of carrying things through all this, and that that push and pull, and like the the way that it works. Like, so when you guys were talking about last epoch, and like I have the, I'll have the very opposite take here. It's not a very strongly held take. Just to, to hold on. <laughs> but the whole like pulling the community and listening to them, fuck it, no. Like I actually don't do that. Um, I actually firmly believe in now as a large corporation, whatever, sure, you know, do the thing for them. But as like for me, if I want to make a game, I want to make my game, and you know, I'll listen to your criticism. But maybe I maybe I take it, maybe I don't. And like I. The I shouldn't care beyond whether I think it makes my game better, not whether you think it makes my game better. And the, it's like, I, I at the end of the day, like I think it's I view it more as like I'm making a movie or I'm making a book or something like that. I'm not making it for you. I'm making it to satisfy my creativity, and I want to make something that I'm proud of. I want to make it the best that I can. I definitely want to have like editors and pre-readers and people playing it and like get ideas. Like you, you can only make things better through collaboration. But there is there should be a hard line where the actual creative vision should hold steady. And like that that is actually a thing I respect a lot about GGG is we're like, yeah, you all are going to hate this. We don't care. Uh, this this is our vision for what we think is an awesome game, and we're gonna make this as as our game. And I it doesn't matter who the developer is, like as as long as it's a strongly held creative vision that is someone's, you know, that is their passion project. That's what they want to make. I will respect that even if I hate the product in the end way more than some corporate committee designed um, just, you know, corporate product that's just there to make money. So, yeah, I yeah, I just don't really care what the users think um, beyond, be you know, ideas. Okay, can I, can I ask you a question on that? Subtract them yeah. real quick. Okay, so do you think that last e what Last Epoch did is maybe maybe does not interfere with what you said. So you said gaming company has their vision, they make it for themselves. What I what I envisioned that this poll that Last Epoch did was is they told the community what they were going to do. We are going to fix the bugs in our game and we are going to fix the overpowered builds whether it's by a bug or not. That is going to happen. The only thing that they let the community choose is the cadence in which how it happens. They only asked. Oh yeah, that's totally are you, fine. Yeah, you're good with that. Okay, I'm that, totally good with that. Yeah, I just there's is is Blizzard. The, who's the most guilty of doing this? There there have just been examples of games in the past. I don't have an example in my head right now, but I know there are times in the past where just the community uproar and people complaining, and then the company kind of uh, or the designers kind of just following what they did making the game worse and like the actual vision for and like the soul of the game kind of got lost over time um kind of just making this corporate product in the at the end of the day and it's just i i just don't want to see that happen but yeah i, I mean so just saying hey should we, yeah 
I can see what you're saying about products that are like unique new products. And I'm sure that if you were meaning like Halo, for instance, <laughs> you know, you have to respect the original IP. So it's, it's, the take is a good one. I think when you're making something that is like a unique, fresh vision, and then maybe when it comes to like stuff that's based upon other things, this is why we see the community like get more angry when, you know, oh, but my nostalgia, like um, you're influencing something that, you know, like D4 is compared to D2, right? Would you say that in scenarios like that one, would you listen more to community feedback when it's based upon something that's not an original concept, but is a follow-up on something previous? Because I think this is an interesting train of thought. Yeah, so, I mean, I would, I would just step all the way back and say, if the thing sucks, then you're probably incompetent and probably shouldn't be in charge of the product project. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like how how many people how many how much community feedback do they need for D2 resurrected? Pro like I don't think they were just running polls and asking the community, like, oh, what exactly do you want? Maybe they did. I could be wrong. The only thing but that I they... feel like Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was gonna tell you, the only thing that I can remember from Diablo 2 Resurrected that they asked the community is they asked they asked questions where they were considering deviating from the original game let me give you an example one thing that the diablo 2 community begged for them to change from the original one is when you open the cow level if you kill the cow king you can't open the cow level anymore and people love to kill cows all day and so vicarious vision asks we can remove that if you kill the cow king, you can kill the cows as much as you want. Do you want us to? And like 90% of people said, for the love of God, let us keep cowing. Because you'd break your entire character. Mm -hmm. You can't do cows anymore. But I don't think they, they did it. You're right. They didn't do any polls about fundamental changes to the game unless they were deviating from the original title. Yeah, I yep. think like using the, this polling and like, you know, very like you know, imprecise topics and like you know very, very like you know something that maybe the developers themselves are unsure about like it doesn't really take away from the vision of the game when they make a poll in last epoch and say hey we're planning to nerf the stuff like is this like what we should be doing or not like you know this is a kind of like a unique new situation i guess they find themselves in like they have these overpower builds people are complaining that you know the, only those two builds are the, the thing to play and everything else is kind of left in the dust and yeah they didn't foresee this i guess they were never never in that situation they probably also didn't really you know have like a an emergency plan for that necessarily right and then i think it's fine to like ask the community like what do you guys think but yeah you know, obviously yeah. like for for like the poe standpoint like okay you know poe like we, we talked about gg taking risks and making crazy new league mechanics and you know sometimes it's hit sometimes it's miss and uh, this is just how they develop the game. And I guess if if they would go out of the way to like ask the community, okay, what kind of stuff would you like to see? And everyone says, we want more Legion and Breach because that was awesome or something. Then you get, get a lot more mechanics that are just kind of like bland, okay, mow down a bunch of enemies that spawn out of something. And that's kind of it. And instead of, you know, stuff like Blight or stuff like Necropolis or stuff like, um, I don't know, what like Expedition or something, right? And... Um, yeah, we would probably never see these things if they like take like care too much about what the people think. Because maybe also like the, the game developers have like a lot more crazy ideas that they could implement, and they also know what the possibilities are compared to just some some PoE enjoyer, right? Yeah, I just, I have very um a lot of my background is in fighting games and old school RTS games, and there was there's just something very special about a certain vision of, of a game kind of being released and, and being um, and not being constantly polished down and everything changing. Like, I, I think Overwatch is actually a pretty good example. Uh, but if we start with, like, look at Brood War, right? If we're just going to talk about Blizzard games. Brood War is so cool in that it's been out, like, so there was, a, I think, I forget the exact, uh, Day 9 has a really good video on it. I forget the exact everything that was talked about, but it's basically, I think it was like PV, I think, no, ZVT maybe? It was basically ZVT was impossible for Zerg for like 10 years. And, uh, you know, this was a thing where if it was a live service game, they'd be like, oh, ZVT is trash. We're going to, um, Mutas get plus one damage. Maybe, you know, maybe Marines get minus one damage. And they're just going to keep polishing it until the way that people are playing it, you know, this getting a 50% win rate. But what happened 
was like one day or like one guy, like one Zerg player just studied. Like he went really hard. He just, he went in the lab and he figured out that you could do like a bounding box. You could do a bounding box and like M click all of your mutas. And instead of them grouping up as so like AOE damage would kill them, they would keep formation and then they would stay spread out. So the AOE damage from the anti-air wouldn't kill the mutas. And then it totally shifted the matchup. It was literally a like 10 years later, someone got good and it changed the entire conception of the way that it worked. Um, and then on the flip side, you look at Overwatch, <laughs> where Overwatch, uh, you know, it, it has some broken stuff, I think in season one, maybe season two. Season three had this real, really beautiful balance. I think it was three or four, had this really beautiful setup of balance with a lot of like decent rock, paper, scissors, but it wasn't like hard, hard counters. You could outplay people. It was really, really fun. It was like the heyday of Overwatch. And then because it was a live service game, and they were like, they had they had this constant community outrage about certain things that are quote unquote balanced. The game got polished and and narrowed down into this like amorphous blob of a game for years and years, where like goats was the meta forever. Everyone hated it. Like there were no DPS people playing, and the game really stagnated because it just it had this like the the creative vision was lost after a certain point. And I'm always gonna push a, you know, I'm always gonna push up against like that being lost just for the sake of a couple people kind of being unhappy. You know, I'd rather see people take risks and be like, yeah, this thing has, you know, you get a power fantasy, you get have fun, and you know, we always go back to the, uh, you know, the opinus. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with like a, a point that you made a little bit earlier, where I, I, again, just kind of zooming out at the entire topic. I think if a gaming company doesn't have a clear vision for what they want to do with their game, I think it's going to destruct on its own. Um, you mentioned, you know, you were really surprised that, you know, Diablo 4 went through the turbulent times that it had and it still survived. I, I agree with that take. And it looks like now they're starting to get an idea of the direction that they want to take it forward. But I think this is the number one reason why Diablo 4 has had so much trouble. Um, and to your point, I think there is certainly a, there are certainly things that you can take inspiration from and ask the community to influence your game. And there's certain areas where you should you should do it yourself. Um, I think it's on a case by case basis. And uh, yeah, I mean, the companies that you one of the risks that you run for a path of exile who and I don't know I don't know how they operate things they don't invite me to test it and they shouldn't invite me to test it cuz I don't know jack shit about the game right now this poe 1 but you sometimes you miss critical things like you know the video that Karn made so for me personally it, there's no like right or wrong answer and to your point if they don't have a clear vision I think the game's going to die anyway mm mm-hmm. mhm Yep, I'm with you. I think uh, community contact is good. Communicating with them, you know, learning, learning from them, figuring out where you messed up, like, you know, the left mouse button thing that they did recently, and, you know, like the call to arms miss. Those were huge misses, and I, you know, just to give, continue to give them credit, you know, Mark was on, was, you know, interviewed just a couple days ago, and he was like, yeah, we messed up, and we're going to keep working on it, and we're going to try to, that was a thing that we missed. We took your feedback, and we didn't realize the consequences were that bad, and yeah, there are things, you know, developers are not perfect. But, you know, to, to my point, he also said, at the end of the day, we still believe in the reason why we did this and that we're keeping our, like, the core change, but we're going to try to address the fix to what got lost there and still make it so in the end, it will be a better, better for the game in the long run to just rip this Band-Aid off. But then we're going to try to, we're going to try to make up for some of the wounds that we inflicted as well. Yeah, for sure. Like, it's, it's definitely good to see that you know the developers can also like agree that that something was maybe a miss and a mistake, and then you know come back from that maybe the next patch or something. And I think that also just makes them get accepted a lot more of their decisions, and you know makes the community also just like feel more positive about you know maybe stuff they will try to do in the future to you know solve problems or come up with like cool innovative leagues or something, right? And it kind of gives you like a positive feel about the future when they say, okay, like this, this didn't work out. We're going to try something else next patch or something. So I think that's, that's very, 
very good attitude to have for the developers as well, instead of just saying, okay, we're going to stick to this no matter what, and, you know, we don't care. So if, if, like, if it's like clearly such a downside to the game, and everyone really hates that change, then vision or not, I guess you should definitely reevaluate and maybe provide another solution at some point. Okay, uh, do we have any other like last points to make here about you know the, the general like you know RPG space or like the development or something? Because otherwise, I would wrap it up here. Uh, we had actually a very long discussion. <laughs> it was like three yeah, hours. It was real, yeah, real good, good talk. Yes, it was a good chat, boys. Yeah, I had, I had a very good, good time. time. Yes, and um, yeah, thanks for joining. So DM, Rax, and Subtractum, all really big um, ARPG blasters in, you know, multiple games. And I mean, everyone knows these names, I guess, or probably most of them at least. You can also give everyone a shout out here if they have mods in chat. But uh, I appreciate it very much for you guys to take the time to join us. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the Necropolis League myself, so I guess everyone here is going to be blasting that, and well, let's see what will happen with, with like the, the other games, the other patches coming soon. We talked a lot about D4, about LE, and PoE 2 on Horizon, so I think we have good times ahead, and this was kind of like the main reason for me to make this podcast. It's kind of like, you know, this uplifting, uplifting moment right now that I feel is like in a community with like, you know, lots of really good stuff is coming. And it was great to talk about all of it with you. So thanks, guys. Yeah, we have it is a good time for ARPGs. Last Epoch launch into PoE New League into the PTR for D4. It's going to be a good month, boys. Appreciate you guys. Keep blasting. Heck yeah, we'll let's do it much. again. Yes. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> all right, have a good Catch one, you guys. guys. Later. Yeah. Bye. 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 Yes.